Welcome to the 101st episode of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. So damn paranormal. My name is Jason Knight, host of the show, and with me, as always, is... Oscar Spector. Producer extraordinaire and podcast co-host. Coast. Coast. (laughs) Well, here we are, just past our 100th episode. Mm-hmm. Going uh, going on to the next one hundred. Do you feel like uh, so it's like, like, an, we're back like to a one. veteran at this now? No. Now that we're past a hundred now? <laughs> no, not at all. Does it feel like you've done a hundred missions yet? I still feel like I'm a novice. Is your first tour still? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well that's uh, that's a little disheartening. I thought you would say no I am an old veteran. Uh, Call me Cronkite. Cronkite. Yes. Right. So um God. Mm. I'm I'm burnt. I am Zapped. You're zapped. Tired. You are tired. You've I been telling literally me just flew in from New Jersey. Yeah, you've been telling me. Oh, you just been kicking your ass. <laughs> you yawning yeah, on I the remember. podcast. I am. I try to cover it. You had to mention it. I covered it fine. <laughs> you mentioned it. You literally just did the opposite of covering. You almost swallowed that mic when you yawn. <gasps> like Kirby? <laughs> yeah. Suck it up. It's an old, old game. Uh, well, they keep making it, so it's kind of new also. Yeah, my kid loves, Nico loves Kirby. Kirby's great. Yeah. I still love Kirby. Yeah, tired, man. Tired. Yeah, you've been telling me. Uh, yeah, I probably won't shut up about it, do I? No, you can't. You, this is a platform, bitch. This is your platform to talk about. It. <laughs> you literally have created a platform in which you can discuss whatever you want. And it's the opening, so this is the time to do it. I guess you're right. If you want to vent a bit. I just, I've been going since yesterday morning at 6 o'clock. Yeah. And now it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Yes. And... I've worked, mm-hmm. I've flown, I've driven, mm-hmm. I've not eaten, <laughs> been drinking. Didn't you swallow some Wendy's you mentioned? Oh, yeah, I did. I, I did haven't eaten, by the way. Slam some Wendy's. I ate one sandwich that had ham and cheese in it. Ham and cheese? I made it myself. I make, oh, dude, I go cross, I, I get the fancy French brioche bread. Oh, I like brioche. I make it on that shit. And I get like monster cheese. And I like love a, monster cheese. And like combine it with cheddar sometimes. <gasps> and then like put some ham in it, some just mustard, though, no ketchup. No mayo? Uh, yeah, some mayo. Yeah, mayo too. Okay. Mayo's the, the, the glue, right? And then, yeah, eat that fucker up. It wasn't enough. I only had one left. Eat that fucker up. Yeah. I said we pause the show and go make some sandwiches. I did make myself hungry right then and there. I wasn't Shit. thinking about it, but now I am. I could make you not hungry really quick if I tell you a story. Oh, okay. Can I tell you a gross story? I mean, don't make me hungry because we're going to sit here and record. <laughs> so, yes. So, you know how I fucking hate flying, right? I think you mentioned that once. I think all the listeners know. Yeah. I am terrified to fly. I hate doing it. and I, I, I have to fly for work. And I'm going to be flying a lot more frequently uh, in the upcoming You're months. You're kidding? No, not kidding. That's a, that's a good thing. That's like a promotion, more um, responsibilities? We're working on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's going to require a lot more plane travel. So, I'll probably become a drug addict to get by, but that's okay. Um, so Doc, today, aging Doctor Adivan. Yeah, pretty much. So today, I get on the plane. Mm-hmm. Really tired. Mm-hmm. It's been I've been in Jersey since Monday. I mean, no it's, one likes to be it's there. It's Friday at this point. Even right? Jerseyans don't like to be there. Exactly right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, just long, just hard week of work. You know, fight through security. Security was almost a half hour. Get to my gate. I still had to wait another hour and a half for the plane because I was delayed, of course. Of Always course. delayed out of Newark. I finally get on the goddamn plane, and I'm way in the back. Now, I'm stressed about being way in the back because you feel everything at the back of the plane. Yeah, you do. Every little bump, shake, shimmy. I know the feel. Mm-hmm. Horrible. I right? like it. It sucks. I like it. It makes you feel like I'm... So now I'm even more aggravated, mm-hmm. and I sit in my seat. I'm on the aisle. So that's nice. That's good. I have some room. And the seat between me 
and this girl against the window is empty. I'm like, this cannot be true. This is this is great. This is actually a great thing, right? So I get in. I got a buffer up. seat. Yeah, yeah. I buckle up, and I just kind of lean back and I close my eyes. I'm like, I got. I'm gonna try to get some sleep because we got to record tonight, right? I gotta be. I gotta be alert and and at a at a ten for the listeners. Yeah. So I'm sitting there and I'm just. I start to just kind of doze off. I feel it happening, and all of a sudden I get a tap on my shoulder. I'm like, fuck. So I look up. And it's this little Indian lady, mm-hmm. okay? She's like, oh, I sit there. You mean Hindu? Yeah. Okay. Well, it, Hindu, Indian, right? I don't know. Uh, Hindu. Okay, she's a little Hindu lady. Hmm. She's like, I sit there. Yeah. Like, fuck, there goes my, the middle seat. Now right. I've got you know, three in a row. I'm like, okay. So she sits down, I buckle back up, put my head back. Engine, you know, the engine turns on. We're idling. The engine turns on. Yeah. So I put my head I'm about to drift off again, and I feel a tap on the other shoulder, and it's this lady. She's like, "I need to get out." I'm like, "All right, cool." So I unbuckle, let her out, sit back down. She's gone for a while. The plane starts rolling, then she comes back. Excuse me, can I get in? Yeah, okay. So I get up again, let her in. Five minutes later, and now mind you, this lady when she sat down, she started leaning into me, like with her head bowed real low and she's leaning into me i'm like come on you gotta be kidding me yeah and then she reaches up her hand and she rings the bell for the flight attendant i'm like what the fuck is this what is she doing <laughs> we're about to take off you can't do this you don't do that when you're about to take off where's the any any key so the flight attendant comes by she's like yeah could i help you and the lady says in her little accent she's like i need a barf bag i'm gonna be sick and i'm like this, I'm looking around like, am I being filmed right now? Is this a joke? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> the girl against the window looks over at me with these big eyes, and I look at her. I'm like, oh, this is not, this isn't happening. So <laughs> the flight attendant goes running towards, you know, the, her little station in the back, and you hear her just rustling through all this shit trying to find a barf bag. Yeah. She can't find a barf bag. Meanwhile, this lady's groaning. She's like, breathing heavy i'm like she's gonna die like right here what do, what do i do if this lady dies right here do i not dramatic not, at all not, not say dramatic. anything and right. just get home just let it let her figure let people figure it out once we land so i can at least get off the plane and she's just making all these crazy motions i'm like okay i'm getting infected by some sickness right now i'm freaking out finally the flight attendant comes back gives her the bag Lady starts hyperventilating into the bag, like you see in a movie, like, <gasps> yeah. and the bag's inflating and deflating, inflating and deflating. I'm like, this can't be happening, right? <laughs> this so can't be happening. When we, st- we start taking off, we're going down the runway. She's still hyperventilating. Me and the girl down the window are looking at each other like, what the fuck do we do? All of a sudden, you hear the noise. <laughs> she just... <laughs> unleashes into wow. this fucking barf bag, right? Jesus. And I'm sorry. It must have been full because she asked for another one and they didn't uh, have it. So what they did is they brought her a garbage bag. You're kidding me. No. Wow. Now, thankfully, she didn't throw up again because okay. now it would be going into a garbage bag and that's just gross. Wow. So the flight attendant's like... There's probably nothing left, honestly. Right. So the flight attendant comes by. She's like, are you Are you going to be okay? And then he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm like, bitch, you ain't fine. <laughs> You got problems, and I don't know what you're giving me right now. Yeah. So the flight, so the lady hands it over me <laughs> to the flight attendant. Okay, so now it's hovering in front of my face for like a couple seconds. Yeah. And the flight attendant's like, "Oh no, you tie that in a knot and put it under the chair in front of you. Maintenance will get it at the end." So they, she brings it back across me. Now this thing is passing it over me again, infecting me with God knows what. You in a Mister Bean episode? It, I I swear to God, this had to be a Mr. Bean episode. You're or, right. Or something like that. You're right. Yeah. So she stuffs this bag of barf underneath the chair in front of her by okay. her feet and shit. Mm-hmm. I'm like, lady, what if you poked the bag with your fucking shoes or something? Now yep. it's going to get all over the floor. It stunk. All right. I bet. So the lady puts her head back and she goes to sleep. Now she's not, she can't be a quiet sleeper. Of course not. <laughs> Snoring like, oh my God, so loud. And every time she would shift, like her arms would lift, and she was wearing a tank top, her arms would lift, and just this 
stench would just waft from this woman. Mm-hmm. And it was like taking over the whole back of the plane. Yeah. And it was the most disgusting thing. And I had to sit there for two hours and smell vomit. A four-year job. And B.O. Well, for my job. Do you, do you hear that noise, guys? Listeners? Do you guys hear? Do, ah, there it goes. There it goes again. My hunger just left. <laughs> it's so nasty, dude. Yeah. This is why flying should be outlawed. You subject people to that kind of torture. And you know the airlines. Shame on you, United Airlines. Shame on you. You should have took that fucking bag. Yeah, you probably should (sighs) have. And now here we are, recording. Yes, we are. Yeah. You made it. Made it. You made it. But you didn't make it for for us. You had to go anyway. (laughs) Yeah, right, right. But you stayed up for us. Thank you. Yes. So that was my little little fun escapade in the air. Mm Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the the flight was just rocking and rolling the whole time. That that pilot had that seat light on the entire time. The seat belts? Fastened seat belts. So we had so much turbulence. Oh, really? It was just horrible. It was <laughs> fucking horrible. It's fucking horrible. You know? I mean, hold on. I need some more drink. God damn it. <laughs> oh, that's great. I mean, that explains why you asked me three days ago to help out with today. Yes. I just I didn't have the time. I got to tell you. Let me tell you a story. Uh, here's something good that came out of your existence this week. Um, your turmoil yeah. is that I got a chance to like, to, you know, flex my muscles on this thing a little flex bit. Flex your research muscles a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. So this, you're you're actually bringing all the research on one of the stories we're going to tell tonight to right. the table. Mm-hmm. I don't think we've done that yet. No, not really. I mean, I've told stories and I've given my hypotheses and stuff. Right. Uh, but it's always been off the cuff or off memory. Right, never right, like, right. Yeah, and this is the first time you actually dug in and really right researched read, a topic. Read a lot, got sick of it a lot, and then <laughs> went back to it. Right, took took a lot of like gaming breaks, not a lot, yeah. but like, I took some gaming breaks, and I'll be like, and like, all right, Lexi, after we pass this level, I have to go back to reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, yep, yeah, that's how it be. I put mine together with the couple hours I had each night mm-hmm. in the hotel because we had events planned at night and. Oh, working wow, really? all day, it was it was very hard. Yeah, so that's why I called you. So thank you for stepping up and it was, helping with content. It was this fun. Week. It was interesting. Cool. Good. I guess tonight we could say we're we're going cold this evening. We're going to a lot of coldness. The You're going to feel the chill. heart of the earth. You are going to feel the chill. Ones. And also, these are horror movie settings, which is very appropriate for the October month fall season we're in. Nice. You're very right. appropriate. And they actually did make some movies. Based on this kind of material we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, especially yeah. yours. Especially the one that you did more than I did. The yeah. Research. I know I'm not mentioning it. I, there's been a few movies. Yeah. And specifically about that one. No, I didn't research the movies. Mm-hmm. I did. Oh, uh, I just quickly glanced their MD page. I didn't like. So we could give titles to the listeners if they wanted to mm-hmm. watch the movies. Okay, good. Yeah, we can. I think cool. I still have those. Cool. Oh. Well, in that case, anything interesting happened to you? Um, any? Well, I got a chance to do some research for the show. Vomit that was my interesting thing. Cool. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> work sucks like a like a ball sack in hell. I think Oof. sounds right. Basically, um, the interpolitics of this particular branch of Starbucks in this particular area, which is called a district for them, is uh, pretty. It's the bar is set so low. I can. I mean, it's it's just awful from the either the glory days of that district, which is when I started. Or from some glory days of the Starbucks era, right? Of their, what, the early 2000s when they were hitting a huge. Probably, yeah. Um, it's definitely like a, a lesser version of those things. And I'm not saying I am not one. I'm not making it any better or any, I'm not making it worse. But I'm definitely like on the outskirts. And my voice means so nothing to those people. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. And you're a boss. Uh, well, I'm just a, a supervisor. I am not a manager. Gotcha. And I want to see managers to an extent that they are the ones that I met in this district are pretty petty assholes. But but <laughs> they are all proven. It's all fine. They they know it themselves. They just don't want to admit it. Um, but it, like it's they also don't have power either. <laughs> it's really oh, insane. Oh really? Yeah, it's kind of sucky. So but, who's got the power at Starbucks? Uh, well, the customer probably has the most power. I always tell them like, if you have a complaint, please complain for me. You get more out of it than I do. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I I That's can I see that. Well, so I'm not going to go into too much detail from this point, even though I do have a pseudonym here. There are people who do know 
that I do this podcast. Right. So that's as far as I'll go. Um, but they know who they are. You know who you are. It's okay. It's just admit it. I don't care how much of an asshole I look like when I yelled at you last week. I don't care. You know I'm right. <laughs> Let's fucking shape up here. Let's just fucking do our jobs right. It's not that hard. Okay. Anyway, that's my thing. Uh, that's how this week and last week has been. Uh, actually, the last three months, really. Mm. And it's been a, a, a confluence of shitty things happening. Um, it's a little lesser now, but it's Good. still there. Okay. Uh, besides that, it's horror movie month. I've been watching some horror movies. Uh, nothing super like great or interesting. I mean, yeah, I would I'd say some stuff great and interesting. I, wa- I rewatched Midsommar, which we talked about already. Midsommar, you suggested it. I watched it. Yes. I pirated it. Yes, you did. So the copy I saw wasn't the greatest, so mm-hmm. I have to watch it again. Yeah, those visuals are really great. I mean, if you watch it HD, if you can. I could see that. Yeah. yeah. And the story was You also could see faces great. in the forest, too. Oh, really? Yeah, there's some faces in the forest when they're tripping out, especially. Like the first trip out when they get to Sweden. Yeah. Uh, you see like like a, like a weird tree face Ooh. in the forest. See, I wouldn't have seen it because my that copy kind of was saw like very the washed out. I saw it in the theater. I saw it. And then and towards the end... When she's having like all these people around her, she sees yeah. it again. When she's doing the dancing, she sees it again. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah. So you see it a couple times. Listeners, check out Midsommar. It is. It's gonna, I it's saw something. shitty copy, and it was still good. Yeah, so it's pretty good. Awesome. So that again, I saw Jezebel, which I haven't seen in a while. I uh, never seen ever, and I missed it uh, four years ago when it came out. Jezebel, okay. Pretty good, like uh, very personal, like uh, I guess you call it indie horror movie, but it doesn't feel indie to me. Uh, it's a good movie. It's a, it's about possession in a house and it's as Cajun like ritual religion in the background of it. It's you know? kind of New Orleans yeah. almost. Or... Yeah, but it's in Louisiana. It's in the bayou, but it's not Louis- it's not New Orleans. Okay. But okay. Uh, it's not a city. It's like in the middle of nowhere kind of town. Creepy. It's good. Good stuff. Very creepy. Yeah. It does it's, it's good effects. Nice. Really good effects. I think I like them a lot. I'll check it out. Um, Let's see. I saw It Follows again, which I think we mentioned on the show. I, think. I don't Have we talked about It Follows? I don't know. I know you and I talked about it. Because we it both follows like a great it a movie. lot. Yeah, it's a great fucking movie. It follows. Yeah, it's they a did, fun they movie. They did the '80s very well in that movie. Showed it to Lexi, and she freaked the fuck out. <laughs> she kept mm. asking all the questions on the planet about it. It was a really good original movie. It's a good idea. It's, a it's very hard good idea. to come across good original horror. Ghost these STDs, days. right? It's so good. Ghost STDs, right? right. Yeah. yeah, it's great. And then <laughs> when I told her like the true it. meaning behind the movie, she's like, "Why would you tell me that? I'm more fucked up now." <laughs> I'm like, come on, it's just a, just like a metaphor for this other thing. No more sex for you now. Right. Not, no, it wasn't the sex. It was the metaphor for like the stuff you regret from the past because it's like really about that action of being with that one person that fucked you over now. The regret. Right. Okay. Like see. it's about that kind of thing too. And she's like, why would you tell me that? I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was obvious. Um, some great stuff. I have some more stuff on the pike to watch, some horror movies, some staples. I'm going to show Lexi a, a couple more. I can't show Lexi horror movies, Jay. She defies and avoids um, horror movies the way you wish you could avoid flights. It's wow. insane. She hates it. Like no shit. she, It would really affect her, not only in the moment, but it will affect her her sleep for a couple of days, depending wow. on the horror movie. Wow. So I'm trying to pick movies that are like so ridiculous in concept that she can never envision them to be like a real thing. Yeah. So my next one, I hope this is a good one, you know what you think, is going to be Life Force. Do you remember Life Force? <sighs> it's a Tobe Hooper movie. Who did Texas? Texas Chainsaw. Texas Chainsaw. Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, I think maybe his follow up. I'm not sure to Texas. I know I've heard of it. It's I don't space. think I've ever it's, seen it. It's 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 fucking space vampires. Space vampires. Yeah, but it's a great movie. No shit. It's pretty great. It's All it's right. space with astronauts. They're not on Earth, you know, but for the most part. And yeah, it's, it's shit's happening in, in shuttlecrafts and stuff. And sexy space uh, vampires are, are killing folks. Sounds fantastic. So I'm thinking that one next. You know? Life Force. All right. Yeah. Has she has she seen the staples like uh, Poltergeist or I think she's know, like the Jaws movie. I think when she was younger, I showed her, I showed her Jaws on her first year. Okay. Terrified. Her. Really terrified. Her. Yes. <laughs> she, I mentioned Jaws to her. Like, didn't you like Jaws? Like, no, that movie was horrifying. I'm like, yeah, but it did its job. It's a good movie. What's wrong great. with you? Oh right? my it's god. A great movie. Yeah. Close yeah. Encounters. Anything like that? That's not horror though. I showed her in theaters that movie. It, oh, it, really? it did a re-release a couple years back. Oh, I'd love to see that. I took theaters. it to that. I love night. that movie. Man. That's a great movie. Oh, it's a fun movie. I showed it to my kids. They that's a great, yeah, that's, yeah. But that's not a horror movie. What about the Twilight Zone movies? Movies, plural, or the show? Twilight, the Twilight Zone movie. There's one movie, yeah. Yes. I never showed her the movie. I don't think it qualifies. Like, I really want to bust out the big guns. 
If I, I know, if like, I can only show like a couple movies a year, that John Lithgow. Yeah, that's a good one. Clip in there, but not all of them are good segment. either, though. I don't like the old people one. I know people like it, but what about the fun hot, the kid who could do that's crazy make anything with his mind? I love that one. It's a great classic. That's a, that's a classic. And the Dan Aykroyd uh, in the the front in the, in and the, the end. end. Yeah. yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's good. Let the midnight special. Yeah, that's right. right? Yeah, the midnight special. That is great. Ah, uh, I'm sure midnight special is a good movie too. I don't know. So many options. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what's next. Some of that, some of that classic horror was just great. I don't even, not even horror. Just uh, yeah, that's more like like Poltergeist isn't horror. You know, it's uh, I don't know, man. That's pretty horror stuff. You the think? clown scene, yeah, it's fucked up. The clown scene still gets me. How about Amityville? That's a, I mean, that's like psychological kind of. Thriller. Yeah, she would, she would definitely count that as horror. Yeah. One time I showed us uh, Black Swan, thinking oh, yeah. that maybe it'll be fine because it's psychological, the whole thing, and it's. About ballet dancers, and yeah. it's about this girl like going crazy, right? right? Slowly but surely, kind of thing. And um, no, she totally felt the horror in that. <laughs> Katie saw Suspiria recently, the new one. Yes, okay. I she said it was it. really good. I haven't seen it yet. Maybe. I heard it's good. Hmm. I heard it's good. I want to see that. It's yeah. on Amazon. Yes, it is. So I'm gonna I'm gonna check that out for sure. Yeah. Who did that one? Um, that was based off Luca of... Guadalino. Guadalino. That's the director of the new one. The old one is Dario Argento. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So horror movies lining up for Halloween. Mm-hmm. Have you gotten any further on your Halloween costume? Oh, man. Yes. I know exactly what I want. It's been hard tracking really the main piece of it. So you're still in that conundrum of being able to find the... Yeah, so I did buy one already, but it may not get here in time because it's coming from China or something. Oh, so no. like, I'm looking for other substitutes to get before then if I have to. So if I have to double up and buy another one of the same thing or similar looking thing, because yeah. not all of them will look quite the same, but they're pretty close. And for me, as long as they nail the color, I'm good. And uh, that's who I'm going to be. Yeah, it's the guy from that. Uh, Legion. That's it, Legion. Yeah. The TV show. Yeah. Cool. I love it. Got to be careful with the China stuff. Did mm-hmm. I ever tell you what happened when I bought Katie's shoes from China? No. I happened? didn't realize that they were coming from China. No. I found these really awesome shoes that I thought she would love. They were these crazy kind of retro bright pink with like black cats on them with these massive heels. I'm like, oh, she would love these. So okay. I got it for her for Christmas. Mm-hmm. It was taking forever to get here. So I didn't realize when I bought on Amazon they were coming from China. And yep. that shit takes forever. It does. So when they finally show up, like at New Year's um, <laughs> or later, she opens the, I wrap it, she opens the box, she takes the shoes out, mm-hmm. and there's like this funky mold all over the shoes and there's like this thick webbing like webs inside <gasps> the shoe shut up that's all i that's all i needed to see i was going to sell the house <laughs> i was going to have to kill everybody cuz now everyone's infected by god knows what the fuck this shit is oh my god you just introduced a new species to this uh, yeah. to this uh, like, ecosystem did you ever see that simpsons when yeah the Homer, frogs the frogs is it the frog where he opens up uh, he opens up the package from uh. like china and that cloud of stuff comes out and infects everybody oh no i don't remember that one exactly yeah simpsons predicted it so it's another the, thing they predicted the australian frogs though that's the one i don't where remember they, the where they bring a frog from the u.s and it invades australia or the other way around oh yeah that's that too that could have happened too yeah. it was so disgusting dude i bet god knows where these things were yeah what that webbing was what was living in there some kind of crazy asian killer tarantula yeah fucking got that shit out of my house it was dead of winter so it stayed in the garage where it was cold yeah in case there was anything living in there and we sent it back so nice. be careful with china is my point yeah well now well, thanks for that story disgusting well, fuck you jay i mean now i'm worried now i'm worried i hate i you. would be i would literally well, after that stuff from there too i'll like, never order anything from china yeah ever. no i've i still i've done it before i never got anything like that never yeah i've always get like something like i thought you can see the quality was like oh it's a different color completely i didn't know you were gonna go with no. mold and oh and, yeah and webbing disgusting i thought you were gonna go somewhere else fuck wow i just got the skeeves thinking about it again hmm. <laughs> I just remember the skeeves. when she called <laughs> jay <laughs> she calls me from across the screaming across the house <laughs> I'm like fuck what now <laughs> what what I do? Holding up the shoe by her fingers, and I was like, "Put it down. Go wash your hands. Go to the Iron Station. Get your yeah, hazmat suit. Exactly. Right. We won't let the kids go near it. You know what I mean? Just yeah, get yeah. it out of the fucking house. Mm. But so you gotta be careful with Amazon. 
you know, if you're not paying attention. No, no, I knew I knew what I was getting, uh, but it was the closest to the match. So I had to try it. Mm. So um, that's why I picked it. But Lexi found, thank God, she's, I mean, I'm not saying it's stereotypical, but she's a good shopper. So like she found me some uh, alternative options. I just got to pick one and just go with it. And did she decide what she's going to be at? No, not yet. She wants to. She told me three different options are all wickedly different from each other. They're like, one of them is some sort of like witch vampire hybrid, and another is um, oh man, I forgot it was what was it? Mm, it's gone. I don't remember. And there it goes. There it goes. There it went. Uh, I'll come back some at some point. But yeah, she wants to be some stuff. I don't know yet. She hasn't decided. Got it. Yeah. Uh, now we got to find a place to go. <laughs> come up here. We're gonna have a party. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We always have a party out, outside. Nice. Bring out the fire pit. We order pizzas. We on the day of. Oh yeah, on Halloween. I guess I took Katie, off. Makes, Katie makes uh, jello shots for all the people who come by, the parents. Great, I'm coming. Just slam jello I'm coming. shots. I'm coming. I'm coming. Any treat. excuse to have the disguise would be great. I'm coming here. Yeah, no, come. I'm going to come here. We always, I'm taking, I'll bring a bottle I'm of that. I'm taking that day and the day after off, mm-hmm. and we do it up. I already got to approve my day off, so it's great. Nice. Yeah, you guys are more than welcome. I'm coming. Talia's going to be, my daughter's going to be it. She's going to be Pennywise. A oh, female, nice. A female Pennywise. No, no more Harley Quinn? No more Harley Quinn. <laughs> now it's female Pennywise. Nice. And Nico's like this crazy skeleton jester hmm. costume he got. I'm going to look yeah. so comfy. My clothing's so comfortable. <laughs> no, it's going to be cool. Because I'm dressed as a guy who's like uh, in that show. He's in a psychiatric ward. I'm doing it from the first season. But he looks so comfortable, and I'm, that's the disguise I picked. Nice. So, uh, no one in the neighborhood is going to know who the fuck you are. Or no one watched Legion. Three hundred fifty thousand people watched the first season, and the entire world. So I'm one of those. So cool. Yeah, yeah looking forward to Halloween. We got to come up with something cool for Halloween for the show. Yeah, we should. That is going to come up. That'll be the next very show. Fast. The next show. Oh my god. The next show will be our Halloween. Last one to do a Halloween one. I don't have time in my life. Well, this show is very Halloween. Like I said, these are movie, these are horror movie type, uh, plots. Yeah. The stories we're doing today. Maybe we could go to one of these locations. Yeah, we could do that, that, that star one, that, the, the one, the place you told me in Wisconsin. Oh, that Long can, Lake, yeah. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. I don't know. We'll put our heads together. Okay. The listeners could send us some suggestions. They could. And we never stopped them. To contact at chicagoghostpodcast.com. Please do so. Nice segue. Yes. Do yeah, that. let us know where you want us to go uh, for Halloween. Mm-hmm. But do it like very fast. Yeah, like you got to do it tomorrow. Yeah. Um, nice segue to the contact info. Yeah, so we do get it. get this show started. Uh, if you want to send us emails about uh, Halloween show ideas or really about anything, Contact at chicagoghostpodcast.com is our email. You can call us at Chicago area code 872-529-0767. What area code is that? Oh, that's like um, Adora, Virginia. <laughs> right? Adora. I spit when you... <laughs> Why did that make you laugh? Adora, Virginia. <laughs> Chicago. That's a Gold Coast. No joke. I actually have, I didn't open it. I have a notes app with a bunch of different towns and places Yeah. for this reason. Are you serious? Yeah, so I just, I just keep, forget, I keep forgetting to look it up, though, but when you ask me. So <laughs> I haven't actually run through them yet. I just make it up as I, in my head <laughs> when you mention it. So, so far, it's at the top of my head. Adora, Virginia, yeah. 872-529-0767. Uh, find us on YouTube, Supernatural Current Studies on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chicago Ghosts. Leave us some love on iTunes. A five-star review helps us immensely, helps us reach listeners just like you. Mm -hmm. We can grow this little passion project of ours. And speaking of iTunes, we did receive a great new review from F. Go Mike. (laughs) F. Go Mike, who left us five stars and wrote, quote, I started listening late summer and have been very impressed by the guys and their investigations. Aw, shucks. Love the E.T. Highway, Bridgewater Triangle, and Serial serial Killer episodes, just (laughs) to name a few, end quote. And Mike did not stutter in his writing. That's my tired reading. Yes. So, F. Go Mike, thank you so much. Please please, uh, continue to spend, spread. First of all, I said, please. Yeah. Please spread the love, yes. and definitely keep talking about it. <laughs> you just called myself right out. I'm just doing it again, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> we uh, are, are we are on Patreon. Yes, we are. The listeners could subscribe to Patreon, Supernatural Current Studies podcast on Patreon, and receive 
among other things, patron only exclusive podcast episodes. True. How did I do? That's pretty good. Did I do okay? Very good. Very good. Sorry, I don't mean to make fun of you for that. You can say I just like pointing it out because I okay. think it makes it funnier. Um yes, we are and I and we are that really really we're doing really good. We have some great uh brainstorming ideas for future bonus episode material is pretty good stuff. Um for Patreon, right? And different kinds of yeah. stuff too. It's so good. We have the next what well, two lined up in yeah. our heads. Yeah, at least. Yeah. yeah. So we have some good stuff coming down the pike, guys. So if you like the show and you want to hear more stuff that no one else will hear, join our patron and get access to that content. Yeah. Uh, I think I covered it all. Oh, website. <laughs> Yes, we have Chicago those. Ghost Podcast dot com. From the website, you get to all of our social accounts, including Patreon. So please uh, visit the website and and check out our our stuff. Yeah, our stuff. Yeah. See, hmm. should we take a commercial break? Let's do it. Welcome back to the show. Well, we're going to get this thing started. Mm -hmm. The lights are turned down low. The ceremonial candle is lit. It's on. And the drinks are flowing. You got your sixth or seventh shot, bro. I know. Yeah. I'm going to start on my eighth here soon. What are we drinking? Oh, so good. Peanut, Peanut butter and jelly mead. We, we, we talked about it on the show. Now we have it with us. Peanut butter and jelly mead by Superstition Meadery. You guys, listeners, trust us. It's good, man. It's so you're tasty. gonna want to. You get sip this. this fucker, but it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You pour yourself a shot and you just sip. Don't down it like a, a 22 year old at the club. Right, like an O bomb. You, you, uh, <laughs> fuck. Triggered, triggered, triggered. <laughs> so I, I bartended for years. Yeah, I know. Right, I know. And I'll never forget. First of all, fuck O bombs. Yeah. Fuck. Fuck Red Bull and vodka. Fuck mm -hmm. all that non. It's nonsense, it's, people. It is nonsense. It, if you're going to a bar on your way to a bar, listen to this right now, and you're thinking about ordering that, don't. The bartender <laughs> thinks you're a fucking asshole. Okay, <laughs> I'll never forget. I gotta tell this story. So I was so gonna funny. start the comment. No, it's okay. I was gonna start the topic. So I was bartending, and this woman comes up to me, and mm -hmm. she's all. She's one of these. Oh my god, <laughs> you know, like. Did, extra did, oh my god! Yeah, just uh, fuck off. Shoving the dark thoughts away, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I had dark thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Strangulation, right? But uh, just one of these. Um, it, uh, just what's the word I'm Flighty? looking for, man? Like um, flighty, um, air, like, airy, like airy, like wanna be a valley girl, but you're in fucking Chicago. A you're not a valley girl. It's a poser. That's just a poser. Yeah, just you know, okay. she had this glittery shirt on. No, oh, right and. You're just fucking annoying. And half our listeners have glittery shirts. They're gone. She bye bye. The, she goes out to the bar and she's like, "Can I have a VCR?" What the fuck? And I go, I look at her. I'm like, "What's a VCR?" She goes, and uh, she did the clicking sound. She's like, "Vodka cranberry." Oh, oh, oh. And I'm like, "Okay, first of all, <laughs> wouldn't it be a VCB?" Nice, you know. And yeah, that would be it. it uh, I wanted to shoot myself. Like at that instant, <laughs> chopsticks up my nose would have been better than dealing. Instant chopsticks. I go, okay, so you're going to have a vodka cranberry. Got it. <clears throat> anyway, that's my story. That's great. No, it's fine. Just listeners, don't be one of those people, please. It's, it's pithy. I like it. Um, <laughs> it's a vodka cranberry. VCR. Beta? No beta max? No like beta. I was, yeah, right. Like I was a piece of shit. I didn't know <laughs> like I was a piece of shit. <laughs> like I didn't know what a VCR was. Yeah. It's all good, man. Ugh. Anyway. So the lights are turned down low. Drinks are flowing. Ceremonial candles lit. Oscar on the hot seat. It's pretty warm. And you said, you said right before we came back from break, you're like, I'm a little nervous right now. I'm a little bit nervous. Is this what it's like to be Jay? Well, I just don't want to fuck it up. Which is, I think, is how you feel. Yeah, all the time. All the fucking time. All the time. Apparently. So, you brought a, you brought us a topic, mm -hmm. and I said at the top of the show, we are going cold today. We're yes. going to... Which is a very a very nice, um, you know, theme for what's going to happen here. Yeah. You're going to feel the chill. Remember when you've seen The Day After Tomorrow, or when you've seen The Things, just John Carpenter's The Thing, 
you feel that cold because it's constantly cold in those movies, right? The weather is constantly cold that you feel cold yourself watching it. Uh, we kind of hope we give you a little bit of that because it's just cold. Yeah. Now, granted, uh, the story that I'm going to start us off with, it's a little colder than yours, but honestly, not by much. Both fucking cold. Both fucking cold. Fucking cold. You don't want to be there cold. I want to get the fuck out of here cold. How can I ever fuck anything that moves here cold? That's how cold it is. <laughs> <laughs> now that we establish that it's going to be cold, right? I'm just we're you know, we're, we're, we're going I'm painting to, a picture, yes, because this is an aud- an audio medium, so you right. got to ta- paint that picture, right? I have to, I have to paint something, and I have to, I can't only do it my own way, right? So I have to say things like, you know, fuck anything that moves cold, fuck, <laughs> right, right, and and these are two uh, nearly inhospitable places, yes, on one Planet of them Earth. actually inhospitable, probably, yeah, right, yeah. yours, yeah, nice, all right. All right. You ready? No pressure. Do I have to start off the way you do, like, by saying, like, once upon a time? You never say that in your life. I never, I've never said that. One of the greatest and scientific challenges is actually, in scientific community, mind you, is drilling through four kilometers, <clears throat> two miles, to get to the most pristine and untouched water, as well as keeping it uncontaminated. That place is called Lake Vostok. Or Voshtok. I'm not sure how the Russian pronunciation is. And what it really means, literally, is Lake East. East Lake. Okay. It's uh, it's a lake about the size of Lake Ontario. That's massive. It is huge. First of all, that's huge. It is uh, classified as a subglacial lake, meaning that it lives underneath ice. Two miles of ice. Two, <laughs> two miles of ice. Could at, you... at the worst part, though. Not like there's ebbs and flows. Okay. You know, so there are better parts for them to drill than other places. They're not as, but yeah, two miles of ice. I just think imagine of that driving, right? You're, right. you're driving down the road. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, next exit, two miles. Like, yeah. Where the fuck is the exit? This is right. forever. No, it's forever. Yeah. And it's, it is insane. And so Lake East or Lake Bostock, um, named after this guy who first discovered it a long time ago. Um, And he, it was funny because his discovery was proven like 30 years later or something like that. And he was Russian and it was uh, set on a Russian uh, Antarctic station. This is in the South Pole, Uh, not specifically the South Pole, but like east from the South Pole, somewhere close by. And it's said to have negative 128 degrees on its surface. And it's the coldest recorded place on planet Earth in history. Oh, my God. To this day, apparently, still. I haven't seen any other... I try to look it up a little quick. Like, well, what's the coldest place? And it's still this one, I think. Still Lake Vostok. Mm-hmm. Which is on negative 89 Celsius if for international listeners. Oh, good. good. Um, and the water temperature, believe it or not, inside the water, once you get those two kilometers down there, if you ever can get there, which is very hard to get to, is 27 degrees Fahrenheit. Not okay. negative. Wow. Positive. And that's uh, because uh, the way it's set up, the way this nature aberration, for lack of a word, like, you know, miracle in a way, it's said is that uh, the ice covers it with enough pressure and obviously the weight and, and the ice itself covers it in a way where it keeps it liquid. It keeps it above freezing temperature. Damn. So this lake wow. has been there for guess how many years, Jay? Well, I mean, if it's under, would you say two miles of ice? Two miles of ice. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be a million years. I mean, it's no, it's, be... it's, it's insane. It's like at least 15 million years. But they say 30. They say 15 to 30. Then I guess... 15 to 30 The reports million. I said had like those two variations. And they would say 15 to 30. But some of them said plainly 30. Some of them said plainly 20. But 15 to 30 years. Million years. Oh, my God. It's insane. It's prehistoric, basically. Um, which is... I mean, not that those times, mind you. Those times was hotter back then. But yeah, almost prehistoric. And it is uh, the largest subglacial lake out of the 400 that we know now. And it is the sixth largest lake by volume. Ever, apparently. Huh. Which is insane to think about. And it holds 70% of the world's fresh water. What? I know. It has a lot of, like, pure oxygen down there, too. Apparently a good percentage of it, too. Like, it holds all this shit in there from a long time ago when everything was the purest and untouched. So I'm thinking back to when we talked about, I think it was the Lake Michigan Triangle, Mm -hmm. when we talked about the Great Lakes. And how much volume of fresh water. Yeah. So this is even more so. Way more so. Than the Great Lakes combined. Yes, combined. Seven, okay, cool. You, you could combine those Great Lakes with some other groups of lakes out there too, and it still wouldn't be, still be combined, right? 70% wow. is a large, that's a big number. 
and it's insane. And um, many things were discovered along the way with this place. And as you can imagine, I will tell you why this place is so important to the scientific community and why this importance will lead us into why we're talking about it today. And um, one of the things in there is that they discovered a small island in the middle of this place. And obviously it's underneath, right? Yeah. Whatever land there is in, in the Antarctica is not much, but it's a lot. It's strange how it works down there. And it's connected by two smaller lakes and apparently underwater, kind of underwater rivers, subglacial rivers that connect these two lakes with other lakes. Hmm. And they've been discovering a little bit more lately as the years have progressed since 2005 when that island was discovered. They've found others because of, guess what, um, climate change. Oh, okay. Here we go. There was that big rift. I'm not going to mention too much into it. I read that article about this big rift that happened somewhere nearby, about 100 or is it 50 miles or 100 miles? I forget. 100 miles away from this place that, uh, you know, one of the huge melting caps that happened that rose the sea levels a little bit, right? Uh, it happened and then it, it created a river or something, a stream thing, like this crack or something that uh, started connecting these other ones apparently. Hmm. So it's getting it's getting closer somehow, maybe over time. I don't know how it's going to happen. Wow. But anyway, but that's actually one of the main goals uh, that the science community wants to discover about this place, Lake Vostok. Understanding it changes, uh, understanding its changes with the climate can help discover what they can do to stopping the global sea levels rising. That's one of the main things. Okay. The other thing is uh, observing the Earth's magnetic field since it's so close to the South Pole. That's another okay. big one. But the biggest one, this is what you'll find interesting, is that NASA and astrobiologists or astrobiological studies are super interested in this place because uh, Lake Vostok has similarities to two other non-Earth places in our, in our solar system. Do you know what they are? I, I don't know. <clears throat> I'm, I'm discovering as you're... This is great. Because well, yeah, I knew about one of these. I actually saw a horror movie based on the research that they're talking about, which is interesting. Oh. I'll talk about it in a minute. Okay. One of them is a, a, moon, a moon in Saturn called, uh, fuck if I can pronounce this, fucking Greeks, man. Enceladus, I think. In, okay. Maybe Enceladus. I'm not sure if the C is pronounced like a C or like a K. Enceladus. It's a, it's a moon on Saturn that has basically all covered with ice in a very similar fashion as to this lake. Wow. Right? And they've discovered water down there. Um, and another one is a, a Jupiter moon called Europa. Okay. And there's a horror movie that was on Netflix. Maybe it was on Netflix original. I'm not sure. It came out a while ago, five years ago, maybe. It's called Europa. And it's about these science, there's a NASA crew who go to Europa and hopes to find uh, life underneath the water because they know it's just a bunch of ice. And if you drill hard enough, you'll find water. And the whole thing is that that movie is made like... Um, one of those found footage movies. So it's all through the footage of their body cams, right? The helmet cams and the, the, the shuttlecraft cams. Yeah. And you discover, like, spoiler alert, that there is life under there. It's like horrible monsters, sea creatures living underneath the ice. Oh, shit. So, but the great thing about this particular Lake Vostok is that it harbors very sim uh, a lot of similarities to that planet, to that moon, sorry, to both moons. So if they discover that life could exist under here in subglacial temperatures and environments, they could then... I hypothesize life existing in those moons. Oh, shit. Therefore, it's alien activity they're looking for. Here on Earth. Yeah. They can discover here by, if they, if they discover here, then, that, then, they, then they can discover the possibilities of it existing just as easily on those moons. Because the same, same glacial thing, right? ice. Conditions. Same exact environment in this one particular Whoa. part. So that's why people are really interested in this place. Okay. All so, right. I'm with you, man. And the alien thing is the thing that fascinated me the most, of course, because of the show, but because it's just the sexiest. Yeah. yeah. Right. And let me tell you, some stuff was discovered. A lot of shit was discovered. Some of the stuff I can't even begin to actually parse through properly. But one of them is this thing called Hydrogenophilus thermolutolius, which is the one of the main microorganism things that they found in there. They found a lot of things in here. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I actually don't have the number on me. It's like, oh, yeah, three, they found 3,500, more than this, 3,500 gene sequences, mainly bacteria, discovered underneath the water when they got samples in 2012. Living? Yes. Some of them are living. Bacteria, I don't know. I think it just lives if it exists. I'm not sure how they work or not. I'm not 100%. Yeah. And I went through their things, and they were like, 
DNA sequencing, all this stuff. I saw the journal, the science journal thing that they wrote on it. Complicated shit. Couldn't even begin. I don't even have, I remember chemistry class, much less this thing. <laughs> and they had all the Gattaca, you know, symbols yeah. and everything. They, that's how they broke it down and discovered all these gene sequences that they were discovered for the first time. So this, that's a lot of information. And a lot of this microorganisms live inside fish in our, in our regular waters. So the fact that that comes from there, that can then hypothesize that there may be fish life living somewhere in there. Because For the come, last 15 they, to 30 million Because these microorganisms tend to live in fish. Where are the fish? Right? Well, yeah. So that's yeah. how they're like kind of discovering things, like the possibilities of things. Could you imagine what those fish look like? I have no idea. That have been down there I mean, think about the Mariana Trench. Of, yeah, exactly. Right? When you go down there, you see, like even Finding Nemo made fun of it, where if you go deep enough where it's all black, I mean, how do the fish adapt? They all look different. Yeah. They have weird lighting, right? They have to create lighting out of, I don't know what, photosynthesis. Bioluminescence. Know, Bioluminescence, something. Yeah. And you see all those weird creatures that look like Cthulhu creations and shit like that. Right. If they exist down there, I don't know what's existing in this prehistoric lake or whatever. <sighs> Man. That's insane. Cool. All right. So there's a lot of that going around. So um, one of the main things that happened uh, with the Russian, this is a lot of Russian scientists work, by the way, because this is on top, like I said, at a Russian... Uh, station, and they've been going there for 30 years, over 30 years by this point, drilling and whatnot. And in 1998, they kind of did a boat, they did something successful, they didn't, they didn't pierce the lake or anything, but they got there pretty good depth, but they found out that they were contaminating, or the possibility of contaminating the water or the ice was high, because they used Freon and kerosene and uh, and whatever other materials they brought with them to like chip away the ice, right? Mm. To drill and help drill because you can't just put a drill down there. You have to actually use lubricants. You have to use a lot of scientific jargon to like get in there. Okay. And they had to invent new things and techniques along the way to get to that point. And then they realized that they had to stop because uh, contaminating the water will dismiss all new co- all all foundings. It will all findings will be contaminated, and what can uh, I mean? Sense. If you start finding a lot of kerosene-filled water or ice, is it legit? Are you like damaging the integrity of the whole lake? You don't know, right? Right. So they had to stop doing that. In 2012, they actually had their first big success, where not only did they pierce the surface of the lake two miles in, they they pierced the surface of the lake. Mind you, the hole is not as big as you imagine. Um, it's about the half the size of a tape, maybe like a laptop size hole. You know, okay, kind of thing. It's my understanding. And once they pierced through it, uh, they did this weird bleaching technique, which is hard to explain. It takes such a long time. They have to wait. They take a, a couple layers off with bleach and wiping off, and then they have to wait for it to freeze, and then come back and do it again. It's very strange. I don't know how hmm. it works, but it's apparently like much more careful and safe and all that. And once they pierced through it, uh, the gush of like previously used Freon and kerosene jumped off. So like they were able to discern that most of it, if not all of it, came out of the pressure. Because the pressure is so immense down there. Okay. Uh, I don't know. It's so hard to explain. But the pressure is so immense down there that when they were to pierce through, the pressure shot everything back up. So all, any potential contaminants. Yeah. And they were very happy about that. Okay. Uh, it was like a big success apparently for them. And they were able to do two things. Get out most of the contaminants and pierce through the surface of the lake. Okay. Finally. And so this is where it gets a little weird. Organism 46-B is a thing that came around February 2012, right around the time that these scientists discovered, you know, pierced through the the surface of the lake. Around this exact same time, uh, there was a a couple news articles. I should say Fox News specifically apparently aired something like this, and they don't know if it was momentum picked up from other websites and whatnot, but apparently there's this man who came out of there saying that they were uh, on an expedition— on Lake Vostok, there to, I don't know, I guess discover the, the lake and see what's going there, and that they were attacked by a creature. And this creature is said to be very similar, oddly enough, to the creature made up in that movie Europa I mentioned. I hmm. remember very, 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 it was very similar. So I don't know if this inspired the movie, because I didn't know at the time it was inspired by something like that, but right. maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, we'll see. And what kind of creature can you imagine living down there? Whatever it could be, It's probably the most intelligent and weirdest creature we've had in our seas, which I think it still is today, is a squid. 
Have you seen a squid work? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I mean, they can fit through any hole. Have you noticed? Have you seen videos of them go through like little crevices on the well, ground? Well, octopus for sure. Octopus, squid. Same yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, same same family, I guess. Octopus or squid. You ever seen them qu- uh, get into like fucking right. weird play, like gas? Yes, yes. Like it defies nature. Like where I know they don't have any bones. They have it's like cartilage, I guess, and probably a little bit. Yeah. I don't know what they work on, but whatever they do, they can fit their entire bodies through little pl- little holes, and which a lot of people started like spinning off into this story. So this guy named Padalka, Doctor Anton Padalka, um, who. Is a strange guy for sure. Um, funny enough, couldn't find a lot about him specifically. Hmm. But I was able to find out is that what he's told is that he told all these grand tales about this creature that attacked them the first night they stayed there when they made camp, so to speak, on the lake. And apparently, they, he was saying things like the the creature uh, short like took out the radio and it felt intentional. Hmm. He said either felt intentional or was intentional, and that the quid uh, the squid who was later discovered to be a squid, is 33 feet long with 14 tentacles. Wait, 14? 14, not eight. I, but yeah, I, I don't even think a squid has eight. No, octopus has eight because octo is in the name. Yeah, Squid, I don't think a, like a regular squid has that many. I think it has less. I think it has four to six. Well, I looked up this organism 46B. I'm bookmarking yeah. that. I want to know more about that. Yeah. Uh, while you talk, I'll look up how many tentacles a squid has because that's not natural. No, it's very unnatural. This whole thing is unnatural. The 33 feet long thing is unnatural, but it is uh, that, that that theory in itself in our seas, like in the Pacific Ocean, for example, has been theorized that there's a possibility because the deeper you go, the bigger they tend to get. A lot of things tend to get bigger. Like eels, could, for example, like grow much larger. Yeah down at that depth and when you go really really down into the earth's crust um so this the 33 feet long thing isn't super like unpopular opinion that could happen but uh, the the tentacles is might be though yeah because this, this says here two tentacles and eight arms yeah so i don't know how that works too. this thing has way too many arms <laughs> yeah way too many arms <laughs> enough to spare and apparently along this this uh, x you know this insane expedition they were under this guy who survived one of the few who did apparently he said his best friend uh was one of the first to go when he was lured through toxins that was spread in the water Mm. apparently in their area was spread in the water because he's saying that this organism 46b uh releases toxins that could be effective up to 150 feet because that's how far this person who was his best friend i guess um was when he got like hypnotized, it seemed, or at least like subdued enough for the squid to come in and either eat him, consume him, kill him, oh, or shit. something of the above. And they don't, and it's funny because the way he tells these stories about all these people dying in different ways, uh, he tells it like it's very intelligent and he tells it like it's very threatening, like he does it for the violence. Uh, you know, it seems like it's Damn. eating them. But it also feels like in his storytelling, like he's telling it in a way where like the squid is or the organism 46B is attacking because we're in their territory. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's attacking to get them to get us out, to get them out, okay. you know, to just eliminate threats and then stop and then go back to living however it lives. Huh. You know, it's very strange how it lives. And also that the idea that that squid's there, what's it eating, you know, in general, like we don't know. Yeah, like and what, the fact that it was down there for f- at least 15 million years. Yeah, or like his ancestors were there, right, or something. I don't know how long they lived. Right. Like, has oh, it been man. dormant this I entire time? That. A lot of questions are brought up about that because if it's dormant, what, I mean, does that say a lot about the physiological, you know, makeup of this creature that's very similar to our squids? I mean, can our squids, how long do, I mean, I don't know how, I did kind of look that up, the lifespan of a regular squid, and it does have a lifetime, it does end. But it's uh, it is it can be pretty long depending on the situation. So could this thing have laid dormant based on that freezing temperatures, and then oh. just woken up recently and just woke up and got pissed off? Like it's not a it's not a great morning person, uh, <laughs> you know? I can relate. All right, I'm, fuck, we all can relate. Uh, so that's you know that other questions are you know thought up from the stories, and and if it isn't, if it has been awake this whole time and it has ancestors and whatnot, what's it eating down there? What else is down there that, uh, that great could question. be? That could be food for it. Obviously, it's too big for just kelp. It's too, I mean, there's no kelp down there. As far as, I mean, in the samples they've discovered so far. Okay. The lake is All huge right. now. Lake is humongous. And they've only drawn in one spot, Jay. As far as we know. One spot. 
And, and all of these stories are coming up around the same time the scientific community admitted to them drilling and piercing the lake in February 2012. So it does have some correlation there. And apparently it is just one area of the lake. But the most, the biggest part of the lake, the body of water that's largest, is untouched so far. So we don't know so what's down there. who knows what's there? Yeah, we don't know. We don't know yet. And I don't know if we're going to know. But if you ask me, this whole thing, it seems like a giant premise to John Carpenter's The Thing. Where, you know, yeah, in that movie, for those right. who may not remember, and if you haven't seen it, go watch the fucking thing now. It's called The Thing. It's from 1984, 6, something like that, 82. I don't remember. In the 80s. Kurt Russell. And it's, uh, it's about this Antarctic station. It shows the Swedish side and an American side. And it's about this creature that they uncover, this alien spaceship creature kind of thing. That, uh, well, that's a way different creature. But this creature can assimilate and imitate something it kills perfectly. Yeah. Perfectly. Yep. And the whole point is that you don't know who to trust in the movie. And it wants to get out of this ice hell that it's in. Yeah. You know, because it crash landed a long time ago. And that's the premise of that movie. And it's a fantastic horror movie. Um. But this feels just like that. It's just with squid. It's just with a squid that manipulates people with toxins and shit. And can take out radio somehow. Yeah, so there's an intelligence to this thing. Like apparently a massive intelligence. Apparently it even like disguised itself or made itself its shape to look like a swimmer underneath the water to come closer to someone. Oh, dude, yeah. I just got the chills. He described one of those sets that way too. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Crazy wow. stuff. It's really violent. And it has like, it, we don't know if it's like a hypnotic or telepathy it can use sometimes. But some of the stuff that he that the squid supposedly did um, wasn't just through the toxins either. It was just through approach, just approaching it. It's a manipulative, intelligent. I want, yeah, I, I mean that is that sounds. You know, if we've, I don't know if you ever heard that the uh, the idea that octopuses and squids are aliens that crash landed a long time ago. I have heard that. You have heard that. Yes, I thought of that before because they're super weird. <laughs> they are <laughs> one of the top five strangest creatures we have on this planet. I don't know how they came to be. How do you even evolve from what? Like, how do you, like a kraken you imagine? But also that seems very Cthulhu. Like, again, I come, we'll come back to a Cthulhu Leviathan creature. Leviathan from the deep. Leviathan, that's a good one. Uh, you think of all these things, like they seem so alien already. I mean, they're in our seas now. We know what they are. I've seen them at the Shed Aquarium myself. Yeah. And I've written from their ink pouches, you know, and the, and the pen. Um, it, they, they look so alien. And this just seems to be like the next step, you know. And I think they say with, with the octopus and the squid, there's something within the DNA that mm -hmm. has never been seen before. Like it, the, the cer certain right. building block within the DNA isn't yeah. found anywhere on Earth. Yes, you that's look, true. You can look that up. That's true. That's you can't true. like you can't genome map this fucking thing. Right. Right. And that's that says a lot without saying an answer. You know, that says a lot without the, the non answer gives you a lot of answers. Yeah. Right. And uh and, and not to mention with the actual scientific proof that I gave earlier about the thirty five hundred gene sequences discovered, mainly in bacteria, um that can go a long way with saying like, Well, what of what gene sequences do these things you know, this squid, this organism, and this bacteria share in common is this lake filled with a bunch of things that either existed on Earth a long time ago that we've never known about, which seems to be the most likeliest, mm -hmm. or it could be some kind of alien creature that can only exist or like, how do I say this, um, can flourish in the weird and extreme environments of Lake Vostok. Like, we think of our last ice age, Right. Maybe there was a lot of them back there, right? When everything was frozen and a lot colder. Right. I wonder if they were more, you know, fluid and, and, and multiplied a lot more back then or had a bigger version of it. I don't know what, you know, it, it has a lot of questions that we don't know the answers to yet. But the fact that there are these microorganisms already discovered for reals that are in real places um, means that we don't know exactly its makeup or where it's coming from. Yeah, A big theory, though, about the microorganisms, though, that can go along with this organism 46B is that uh, a theory that uh, one of the guys who worked on it, the guy who posted that main journal entry that I read all the fucking chemistry stuff on, he said that, I think his name is Rogers, uh, he said that uh, a theory is that the the things in this lake could not exactly harbor or didn't cre or didn't help create or flourish this you know flora and fauna that he discovered. It's more like what if it's uh, remnants of the lake before it got frozen over? 
You know, a lot of people are thinking like 30 million, 30 million years ago when this lake was just a lake. Right. Or, Above gro- or at ground level. At ground level. When ground it was attached level. to Africa or whatever, because that's how Antarctica moved around right. in the Pangaea movement, right? Uh, what if it was just like, that's what it was around at the time, and then it got frozen over, and somehow held its chemical composition? Or adapted? Or... That's the weird thing is that we don't know how, if it'll, how it can survive down there, how it can move around, if it's still moving around. A lot of that stuff is still unanswered. So they're digging. But, they're still digging today. Yeah, apparently they still are. They got uh, U.S. got permission in 2015. I read in one of the articles uh, to send expeditions out there and stuff. But it still takes years, apparently. And Damn. obviously, they are dismissing wholeheartedly the whole 46B thing. So because, that was going to be one of my questions too. Yes. Has any other scientists? No, I mean a lot of them have been um, kind of like either uh, very harshly no comments. <laughs> Or, or they're just saying like, no, it's, uh, it's, it's not real. There's no the possibilities of it based on the evidence that you know, not evidence on the on the stories that this guy you know supposedly said are impossible. But I think of like think of that hole right that they drilled on, not much bigger than this laptop, like I said. Um, a squid can fucking fit through that. I'm just saying. Sure. Easily. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I fucking seen them fit through smaller holes, and if a creature like that could exist. I would say that that thing will probably be pretty terrifying underneath all that ice. Damn. Um, it won't be like a, I don't know, like a giant bear, like a polar bear. It won't be like a Yeti, you yeah. know. It won't be, like, I, I can't. A little foreshadowing there. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, or you think of, uh, yeah, so many options anyway. And, um, yeah, and there's nothing else that lives on there. Nothing else. No, there's no Induits, by the way. Inuits, sorry. So no people. There's... Not on that, not that, not that side, no. Apparently not. Wow. Not that I read anyway. Maybe a long time ago. But not they n- never discovered any like human remains or anything. Oh, so far, what a cool story, man! It's insane, and uh, and so a lot of stuff uh, came from Washington Post, for example. And first gave me that flavor, the idea of getting the to the forty six B. Yeah, they mentioned something about like a, a fuck up in twenty twelve's Russian expedition. Yeah, in that February in that month, and like that led me into the into the forty six B stuff. So you know, some of the stuff it's based on real stuff. Uh, we just don't know how much of it is realistic or not. Got it. But uh, it's really, uh, but it's you know, it's really interesting to think about a giant squid um, that can control and manipulate its prey to come towards him or like, or get away from itself or kill itself. We don't know. It's insane. It's a cool well, idea. I love cryptid stories. And that's, yeah, cryptids. that's exactly what it is. It's cryptid, a cryptid right? story. What does cryptid stand for? Cryptid is. Um, it's an so it's it's animal? like an animal that people say or a, a being that people say exists. Oh, I'm just curious where the word came from. You know? Oh, I don't know. No, is it well, short it, for there's, something? There's a study of these. So a cryptid is a an animal an am, animal Aminal. or a being that mm-hmm. people swear exists, but science says oh, absolutely okay. cannot exist. Oh, I see. And that study like the orange is monkey called, gorilla from that one time. Yeah, the orange pendic. Thank you. Wow, that's good. Yeah, right? Good job. Uh, but the study of, it's called cryptozoology. Mm-hmm. So cryptids is a kind of a truncation of cryptozoology. Got it. That's, so what that's I the want. study of these right. creatures. Oh, uh, another thing that was interesting that I discovered that's uh, related to kind of our, not our, our solar system about this lake is that it still has tides. Underneath yeah. two miles of ice, it still yeah. has tides. It still works in the tide, like in the sun and the moon changes the tides. Wow. Still. Dude, I'm going to keep a close eye on Lake yeah. Bostock. Yeah, there's still. This is some cool it's, shit. There's still reports as early. I mean, not reports, but like uh, reports of like, oh, we're going to do this on Lake Bostock soon. Or we're going to, this, you know, we're going to pull samples at this time from 2019 resources too. So like it's still happening. Oh. It's still very much an ongoing scientifically community like thing that people do. Did you did you find out through your research if the public could go or is this? Yes, I did. So because a I, lot of Antarctica how, nowadays yes, it is, is off limits to the public. Well, you'd be surprised. It is and it isn't. Um, a lot a lot of places that are too hard to keep people alive. Kind of those are places that are probably like hands off. But you'd be surprised. Apparently, and I went. So I would try to Google map this place. Mm-hmm. You can't. I mean, there's nothing there. It shows doesn't even show like a picture because I don't even know if a satellite wants me to get like like I'm not gonna go over there, bro, to give you a picture. I'm wondering. I don't know. I it wouldn't let me. Okay. I tried for like I tried refreshing over two days and nothing came up. 
Wow. So I don't know if that's just my fault or maybe, I don't know if it's me or not, but they wouldn't give me an image. Huh. So that being said. Well, that's creepy in and of itself. Right. I did see a lot of people put reviews of this place, Lake Vostok. Really? So they could write reviews on Google and stuff like that. And what did the reviews say? Well, a lot of them had, oh my gosh, so many funny things. Like, oh yeah, I came here, like Cthulhu. Uh, oh, so like people Cthulhu. just fucking around. Yeah, fucking around. A lot of people were saying, uh, some, like I would get snippets of people saying like, oh, I got off on this cruise this cruise line thing, like this expedition for like people, like this, really? for, like I, I forget what they called it. I think you just call it an expedition, but he wasn't a scientist. I know that he was like a, it was like a, like a paid expedition. You can go on a like paid cruise line or something. He said that through one of the channels that he got, one of the other boats he transferred from, he visited Lake Vostok and he said it was beautiful. And he was saying all the stuff about it, like giving it a real huh. visual review of the place. Um, so yeah, it seems like you can go in there at least, through some areas of it, at least maybe some of the edges, maybe. I'm not sure. Damn. But it's a huge lake, so I don't know if all of it is good for everyone to go. I see. Right now, it's definitely all only scientists. And I think you can visit there as a, as a citizen, I guess, uh, some parts. I, I, well, the reason I ask, because there is a lot of Antarctica that is off limits to the public, and it's mm. controlled by different world governments. It's such and a strange place. They say it's because there's... Pyramids under the ice. There's mm. UFOs under the ice. Right. They've discovered bases under the ice that no one made, no human made. Mm. You know, so th- there's a lot of conspiracy, in other words, about Antarctica. Right. So I mean, I it's, it's also like a, was... it's surprisingly one of the, you think of frontiers of humankind, right? It's really a big one. The last one on uh, Earth that we have. I would say, yeah. We don't know anything about or enough about. Yeah. Or at least uh, we, meaning the people who live in it, not like say, not governments. Maybe governments know more. Scientists know more than we do. They have more access than we do, right? And you, even then, you have to be a specific kind of scientist to be able to go in there. You know, you need to study uh, up on that and have the credentials and all that. It's really hard, apparently. I was reading up on some of the credential stuff you need. Like, you need hmm. a PhD in this, and then you have to know about this, and you also have to be trained in survival, and all this shit you oh, have sure. to fucking know before you even get maybe a permission. Wow. You know, to get in there and study something. Well, I say we start working on it. Yeah. Because I want to see this shit. Yeah. I want to see if I could be manipulated by a squid. Uh, <laughs> you want to be manipulated by a squid? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> for, the sh- for the show. You'd be pretty tasty. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'll like you. <laughs> I think you'd, you'd be good. Well, like, crunch your bones up. How do they eat things? I don't even know. Well, the, 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 well squid have like these powerful beaks. Do they have beaks? They do. Oh, yeah. Okay. And it like breaks crustaceans and okay. um, shells. And I don't think I've like ever that. seen a squid in action. Yeah. Only in the movies or whatever, which is fake enough, I'm sure. <laughs> right. so, but yeah, I've only seen an octopus on, the, like I said, in the shed aquarium, but it wasn't like hunting or anything. Yeah. It was just chilling. Hmm. Lake Vostok, anything else about about this location? No, I really like its possibilities, you know. That's the that's the real big thing about it for me. And I love when the the comparison to Europa and Enceladus, the, the two moons. That is really interesting. Saturn and how Jupiter. they could, yeah. if they discover life here in those... No, so conditions, like, and they know those planets have those conditions. You also then could train. Reason of deduction. You could train astronauts on the surface of Lake Vostok and other places in, in the Antarctica to, so they, when they, if they ever go up, right before a mission, that's the place to train them. Because it's the same, so similar. It's so similar. Man, that's crazy. Apparently it's very similar, like eerily similar, which is super interesting because those are two places that people, you know, you think of Mars and you think of a little bit of Neptune or um, a little bit of Uranus. Not that anus. And, um, I think it's Uranus. I'm pretty I sure. think that's how they say it. No, I'm yeah. kidding. It's mainly Mars and <laughs> these two moons that people hypothesize as any possibility of any kind of life, even from a bacteria level, could exist. That's where they'll be. These are the three places. Mars, uh, Enceladus, and, and, and Europa. And they all reflect. Well, these two Volstock. do. Mars doesn't. Oh, Mars, right. right. Yeah, yeah. But these are the only places that has water, that we've seen water, and we've seen these kind of things that could possibly have something like life. I love it. You know, not intelligent life, mind you, but who knows? And maybe intelligence is not like I'm saying. They're aliens with spacecrafts. Maybe intelligence is just like very smart predators. We don't know. Huh. That eats up uh, on rocks or I don't know what the fuck they do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any any stories of uh, UFO sightings or weird things in the skies during these expeditions? Funny there? enough, no one's ever said reported on that. I try to look up look that up, and uh, I did get some reports on that, but it wasn't in that area. Okay. And definitely wasn't around the time they were drilling. It was other places in the Antarctic where the skies are super clear and amazing. Okay. Like people have seen some shit. Oh, but yeah. never yeah. around, never like in this area specifically, never in correlation with the drilling or with the uh, 
with the uh, discovery of oh no when when they hit the the glacial lake. Okay. Uh no, unfortunately no. Okay. But I'm positive it's gotta be some crazy shit up there. Oh, in Antarctica there is. I mean, we should do an episode or two on Antarctica UFO sightings and aliens and what's possibly under the ice there. Yeah, I mean that would be. Oh, great, you said pyramids in the great park. couple times. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what they say. And you think of you see uh, we talked about pictures and the on the what was it California coast or something and on the water we saw the it would look like pillars and oh yeah and that was when we were doing the thirty third parallel episode that's right that's some freaky shit too right. <laughs> and listeners go back uh, through our archive and and listen to the also like thirty third parallel episode the Antarctica Antarctica is one of those weird no man's lands where countries can just go in there claim an area. And yeah, go nuts. Apparently, and go nuts. Apparently, yeah. Go nuts. <laughs> the fucking the uh, the amount of control and freedom they have is as much as they have. Like it's insane there. Yeah, and they have and it's no laws. You, you, you could just Sweden can just own this area here, and the United States can own that, and eventually they'll collaborate. And like, okay, scientists, you can come over to our land, and after we've already rampaged through everything and or whatever, taking everything. I mean, that's that, how I uh, felt with the Russian thing, for example. They it took so long. I don't know if it was Russian. Just Russia giving them permission in 2015 to eventually go, but it took a while for whatever paperwork, whatever laws they have to make. I don't know how, what stopped them for so long, but they discovered this fucker in the 50s, confirmed it in the 80s or something like that. Fucking started drilling, drilling, drilling. In the 90s, they made that fuck up I told you. 2012, they, they, they got the hole in there, and all that time, it was just them. As far just as we the know. Russians. As far, I mean, now, unconfirmed reports, I don't know if they did illegal stuff. Like if American, some American expedition did something under underneath the radar. I don't know about that, but that's a possibility. Sure. But um, all uh, as far as legally goes, no, it was just Russians. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Very interesting, Oscar. Good, good thing. Uh, good topic you brought to the table tonight. I yeah. think. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too terrible in my delivery because I went through everything already. I think that's all your notes. I think so. All right. I mean, there's some little things. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, for my story, we're traveling uh, 15,399 kilometers. Hmm. I didn't do the math to miles. Oh, that's hard. So it's 15, Don't ask me. 15,399 kilometers from Lake Vostok all the way over to Siberia, Russia. For my little story. So uh, more Russians, Jay. More Russians. That's and right. more cold? Lots of cold. Dude, I know. No joke. And lots of death. Lots of death. So, on January 28th, 1959, 10 experienced hikers, mountaineers, and skiers set out on a skiing, hiking, climbing expedition in the Ural Mountains in the Siberia region of Western Russia, which was the Soviet Union at the time. Hello, Soviet. The members of the expedition were the leader of the group and an experienced mountaineer, 23-year-old Igor Dyatlov. Then there was 21-year-old Yuri Doroshenko. 20-year-old Ludmila Dubinia. Isn't it? 23-year-old Yuri Krivishenko. Krivanashenko. Nice save. Edit it. 24-year-old Alexander Kolevitov. 22-year-old Zenaida Kolmogorova. Kolmogorova. That's pretty good. You did that right. Did I do that good? Yeah. No. 23-year-old Rustem Slobodin. 23-year-old Nikolai Thibodeau Brinolis. That sounds Spanish. That's a little French to me. 38-year-old Simeon Zolotaryov. And 21-year-old Yuri Yudin. The shortest name. The last one. Yes. Uh, it's funny because there's a lot. all these people have middle names. <laughs> and Jay opted, you know, rightfully so, to avoid them. Yes. But, man, they have Alexievich... Alexandrovna. There's so many middle names. So anyway, many middle names. Same. So many letters. So Sorry. many letters. It's like I'm reading Tolstoy's book here on the <laughs> One Piece. Anyway, so out of those ten people I just named, that's that's eight males and two females. Okay. Nine of the party members were students of the Ural Polytechnical Institute, 
So they knew each other. Mm-hmm. And the 10th, the 38 year old named Simeon Zolotaryov, he was kind of an outsider, but he was a, a very experienced ski instructor. So he decided to join the group, and the group accepted him because of his experience. Yeah. Uh, um, wasn't the Euro Polytechnical Institute called something else back then, though? It had two different names. It had a Soviet name, like a Soviet slightly different name. Did it? Remember? The articles I read, it always said the, the Ural yeah. Polytechnical. Oh, here it was. Ural Federal University. Ural Federal University. Ural Federal University. That was the original. I, okay. I'm, I'm reading it because it's if finding it stuff under that name got me some extra little things. Oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? Like looking it up that way got me like articles from back then oh, called gotcha. when they were calling it that. Cool. So that's in a lifty way. Good. So I want you to keep in mind these people, they they weren't your weekend warrior types. All right. These were skilled outdoors men and outdoors women. All members of the groups were what's called grade two hikers. Right, I like the great thing, yeah. Yeah, and and making this expedition to the Urals would earn the group their grade three hiking certification. Right, because this was a, a hard one. Yes, and and actually that grade three, it's the highest certification available at the time in the Soviet Union. So they're used to being outdoors. They're used to harsh environments. They're mountain climbers, skiers, hikers, mm-hmm. working on this really hard-to-achieve certification. you got to keep that in mind. They know how to survive in these harsh elements. Now, the group's mission was to climb the mountains Ortetin and Kolat Siakl, or Mountain of the Dead, Mm -hmm. both of which are part of the Urals. And sadly, the mission was never completed. Ultimately, nine party members perished under what could only be described as mysteriously terrifying conditions. Yep. And the 10th only survived by pure dumb luck. And before we get into what happened, into what's become known as the Dyatlov Pass incident, I want to just touch on the geography where all this takes place. The location now known as the Dyatlov Pass rests in a 250 million year old northern stretch of the Ural Mountains, or just the Urals, in the Siberian region of Russia. The Urals run approximately from north to south through western Russia and from the coast of the Arctic Ocean to the Ural River and northwestern Kazakhstan, and they form part of the conventional boundary between the continents of Europe and Asia. Temperature in this area can fluctuate, from negative 32 degrees Fahrenheit in the cold months, which are December, January, and February, to the upper 70s, actually, in the warm months, peaking around July. Precipitation varies depending on the month and the side of the mountain you're on, but totals hover between 12 inches and 40 inches of rain and snow annually. The terrain is rocky, and it's rugged, and in some places filled with glaciers. There are vast pine forests. Elm trees are mixed with cedar and Siberian fir and Siberian spruce. In abundance are lush meadows and timothy, clover, and wormwood. Yes, that wormwood. Hmm. The hallucinogenic ingredient found in absinthe. The real absinthe. (laughs) The real one. To look at them in pictures, the Urals really are a beautiful place, and it's no wonder our 10 explorers wanted to hike and ski and climb there. But unfortunately, for the subjects of this story, they didn't find beauty in the Urals back in January and February 1959. They found death, and the cause of their deaths is a mystery to this day. And sure, theories have been offered, each one freakier than the last, but nothing has been proven which explains why nine highly experienced outdoors men and women died under unusual, and in some cases, brutal circumstances. Now, the, the route the party took 
uh, was one that wasn't well mapped out in those days. There were no public maps of their route, and the area wasn't sufficiently studied back then. Yeah, this is 59. 59 yeah. in the Soviet Union, in yeah. the Siberia section of the Soviet Union. Yeah. A lot of people had like a bunch of like a old like techniques. I mean, even if you were born there, like it's all like passed down generationally, right? It wasn't like yeah, it was written down as a scientific method. No, manuscript. right. When you see that tree turn left or at the report. glacier, right, yeah. right, it's like, right, exactly. Like yeah, yeah. yeah. They didn't have streets back then. Just turn left at the mountain best. Yeah, you'll be at my house. Things like that. Yeah, yeah. So this wasn't scientifically studied. They didn't mm-hmm. know a lot about it. In fact, the party leader Dyatlov had to consult with a geologist and a pilot to plot out the, the group's path through the Urals. Definitely. You just don't do this. I mean, <laughs> not a good start. trying to fix it. Like, you're probably trying to make a map out of it, like, and make a nice thing, like, discover how to scientifically work it, right? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. Probably... How do we safely traverse this right. basically uncharted land? Mm-hmm. So not, not too good of a start. There's no real plan here, right? So, the party set out in the early morning hours of January 25th, 1959, from a town called Ivdel, in the town of Sverdlovsk Oblast. Oh, man, you could have had me in do Russia. It. I, I love being Russian names. Oh, go for it. The town of Sverdlovsk Oblast. Sverdlovsk Oblast. Sverdlovsk Oblast. Maybe the oldest one. In Russia. <laughs> From there, the party traveled to a, call, t- a town called Vizhay. Vishai. Vishai. And by January, I'm t- I'm gonna, we're going to get emails that I don't speak Russian, okay? Oh, no. <laughs> by January 27th, they reached their launch site, an abandoned geological station called the Second Northern. The road to their launch site, the, the Second Northern, it wasn't an easy one. Riding in the back of trucks without shocks, in the freezing cold, sleeping on floors, no heat, no hot water, cramped conditions, Mm -hmm. which is what caused Yuri Yudin, his chronic health issues, to inflame during this trip to the Second Northern. Yeah, he had congenital heart defects. He had heart defects. He had chronic conditions with his back, like terribly inflamed nerves and sciatica. So due to his back issues, Yuri Yerdin, Yuri, 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 <laughs> should okay. I just stop now? That's what I'm here for. Was forced to abandon the party and return home. Mm-hmm. What a painfully lucky turn of events for Yudin. Yeah. Even though he left in excruciating pain, he was the only one to survive the doomed mission. Yeah. So on the 27th of January, 1959, the nine remaining party members set out on their journey into the Siberian wilderness. And they kept diaries, lots and lots of diaries. And you could look at these. that's part of how they do expeditions, too. You write down everything. Yeah. Every day you log in something. Every day they were doing like a this. captain's log. Even if right. nothing happened. And star date. Right. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, now, according to a diary entry penned by Zinya Kolomagrova, everyone was in great spirits. They set off on the adventure on horseback. They were singing, and, and they planned to do uh, skiing. They were writing songs. Skies were clear, and the temperature was about 17 degrees Fahrenheit. All were excited for the future, for the mission to climb. And mind you, quite a few members of the Dyatlov, the Dyatlov party, like I said, are keeping diaries this entire way, mm-hmm. documenting what they're seeing, what they're feeling, right. the weather. Right, the weather especially, yeah. Yep, what the following day is going to bring, where they plan to make shelter, stuff like that. Yeah. And nothing in these diary entries is nefarious or particularly strange at all. Now, the last diary entries were written on January 31st into February 1st, 1959. Once again, nothing was written that raises any red flags. Diary entries mention the weather is cold between negative 4 and negative 11 degrees Fahrenheit and that their hiking is going slow. But again, these are highly trained individuals who went into their mission prepared with proper clothing, food, tools. And experience. Experience, tents, even a portable stove. Also, the fact that uh, nothing was reported on these diaries the day before this incident is about to happen in your storyline mm-hmm. is that um, it says a lot about the immediacy and suddenness of what they had to go through. 
Yes. It wasn't like nothing a they, slow ramping thing. They didn't thing. see anything coming. Right. They didn't see right. they didn't sense anything, they didn't hear anything. Right. Yep. Yep. So it's it's slow going, you know, it's cold, but they're prepared. This isn't a big deal. There, there was no stress in the diaries at all about right. these conditions. So the party pitch a tent on a ridge in the Ospia Os- River Valley near <laughs> Otor- <laughs> Otorten. Otorten. Otorten, one of the mountains they wanted to climb. Yeah. And describe, diaries describe the evening, you know, they're cooking food in their tent. They describe that as comfortable. They're having a good time. And we know they woke up on February 1st and hiked about two and a half miles and raised their tent around 5 p.m. that evening on a slope on Kolatsiakal Mountain, that mountain of the dead. Yeah. And there they eat dinner between 6 and 7 p.m., according to diaries. And that's it. Yeah. That's the last diary entry. And this is part of a mistake that a lot of people maybe uh, postulate as to where their first mistake was. Uh-huh. Is, uh huh. Because apparently they were going to, you know, originally keep going, but snowstorms and low visibility caused them to park or park a camp, I should say, camp, at yeah. this slope over at Colat Siakil. Um, there, a lot of people postulate that their mistake was to set up camp on the slope of the mountain rather than move more downhill to the forested area, which would have provided more cover which, from weather conditions. And and think about who we're dealing with here. Right. Why did they make that choice? Well, I think the choice is most likely that they didn't want to lose the altitude they struggled so far to get to by going backwards. Ah. Right? Two steps forward, one steps back, or the other way around. Okay. A lot of people think it's that. Or, you know, they decide maybe they could tough it out. They could probably have the capability to tough it out. And why lose all that That's a good point. Momentum. That's, it. That's the only theory that I think they... Other people said in the reports as to why they would have stopped there instead of going further back down, down by the woods, right? Because the woods play a part here. Yes, they do. So very soon. Mm-hmm. So that was the last entry, right? When they ate dinner that evening, mm-hmm. February sometime that evening, February first, nineteen fifty nine, all hell breaks loose. Yeah, and before we get into what happened to those poor souls. I have to mention that before the Dyatlov party left for their expedition, Igor Dyatlov, remember the leader, told Yuri Yudin that he would send a telegram as soon as the party reached the town of Vizhe Mm -hmm. on their return trip, which Dyatlov assumed would be somewhere around February 12th, 1959, give or take a few days, depending on conditions. But by February 20th, when there was no word from the party, Party family members began to worry and insisted a rescue mission be assembled to go out and search for their loved ones. Volunteers, the Russian army, planes, helicopters were all involved in the rescue mission. And on February 26, the searchers found the group's abandoned and badly damaged tent on the slope of Kolatsiakl. The last place they were known to be based on diary entries. The tent was half torn down and covered with snow, and it had been cut open from the inside, as if those inside, the party members, were trying to escape something that the tent's zippered entrance would have just taken too long. Or maybe the tent's entrance was blocked by someone. It says a lot about panic. Panic, exactly. Right. Yeah. Was that main entrance blocked by someone or something? trying to get in through that main entrance. Mm -hmm. So the tent had to be cut from the inside in order to facilitate a quick escape. But this is apparently one of the tents, right? There were other tents. No, there was one tent. Just one tent. There were were multiple tents stitched into one. Right. That's what it was. Yes. That's what I was like confused about when I was reading it. Yeah. Yeah. So what some people are saying is it would be very easy to patch a rip in their minds as opposed to... The alternative, whatever right. the alternative was. Exactly. Cut the hole, we can come back and fix that easy later, let's just get the fuck out. Yeah. For whatever reason. Now, even stranger than the tent being cut from the inside, rescue workers found all the group's belongings Close. inside the destroyed tent. Yeah. We're talking nine pairs of shoes, fur coats, three pairs of boots, hats, socks, blankets, food. Anything the party needed to survive in the Siberian wilderness was left inside the tent. Mm -hmm. The Dyatlov party fled so fast 
no one even thought about how to survive outside in the harsh elements. All that was important at that exact moment was getting the hell out of the tent. Now we have nine barely dressed party members without shoes or boots or hats or coats fleeing through the Siberian snow away from their tent and whatever caused them to flee their tent and towards the perceived safety of a pine forest that was roughly a mile away from their tent site. A mile. Yeah, I think it was uh, 1.5 for the main forest, but yeah, a mile away for, for the first yeah. stuff. Yeah, so a mile in mm-hmm. sub-below weather, Siberian snow, no shoes, no jackets, right? What the fuck? Yeah. Highly trained individuals, right? So it wasn't safety they found. They couldn't have been more wrong, all right? Right. Because everyone wound up dying. Right. These are nine deaths. Nine deaths. So Igor Dietlov. Experts, uh, you know, examiners agreed that he died from hypothermia, found with a jacket on, but it was unbuttoned, which is strange for someone freezing to death. Yeah. He was found with an incision. Now, the medical report said incision, not a rip or a tear or a gash, an incision, something that's precise on his right tibia. He also had damage to his fist consistent with hitting something or someone like he was in a fight. There was Yuri Doroshenko. He too died from hypothermia, according to experts. He was found with red and brown bruises and abrasions all over his body. In fact, all of the deceased had these same reddish and brownish bruises and scratches all over their bodies. We have Ludmila Dubinia. Dubinina. Dubinina. Died, this is crazy, died from severe chest trauma. Yes. And a massive hemorrhage in her heart's right atrium. Yep, that was the one that was the craziest. Her eyes were missing, Mm -hmm. as were her tongue and the muscles from the floor of her mouth and part of her upper lip. Gone. I thought uh, thought that was someone else. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another one with Mm -hmm. no eyes. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Large amounts of blood were found in her stomach, indicating that she was alive when her tongue was removed. Her nose was broken and flattened, and she had ten broken ribs. We have Yuri Krivonoshenko, died from hypothermia. Skin from his right hand was found in his mouth, and parts of his skin appeared to be charred. We have Alexander Kolevitov, official cause of death, hypothermia, found wearing a jacket, but it was unbuttoned and unzipped. Again, strange for someone freezing to death. Yeah. He was also found with what examiners described as a deformed, quote unquote, deformed neck, and his skin was gray green in color with a tinge of purple. He had no remaining soft tissue around his eyes. Yeah. His eyebrows were missing, and portions of his skull were exposed. Keep an eye on that eyebrow thing. It goes along with the theory that comes out later. For me, anyway. Now, his nose was flattened, and there was an open wound behind one of his ears. Flattened nose, deformed neck, a wound behind his ear. Sounds like the result of a terrible fight. But with who? Or what? What? They found Zenadia Kolomogorova, official hypothermia, death. But she seems to have been the best dressed of the hikers. She was found wearing two hats, long sleeve undershirt, sweater, ski pants, and three pairs of socks. No shoes. I think this is where the chivalry factor comes in. A lot of people were saying that uh, some of these reports were saying about uh, people were like, Offering and switching off clothes to try to help and Steve stave off hypothermia. That and taking clothes from the dead. And taking clothes from the dead. Yeah. Hold on, um, pouring a shot. No, that's fine. And uh, people were supposing that uh, since all the men nearby gave whatever their hats to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. To like help out someone. Chivalry, like you right. said. Yeah, yeah, chivalry. So a lot of people were saying that that's the, pos- that's the biggest possibility as to why she had the most clothes on. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's good. I hope so. I hope there was some chivalry among all this chaos. Definitely. It's not that Donna party. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, 
Zenaida, she she had a bruise, this long, bright red bruise in the lumbar region on the right side of her torso. Examiners stated that the bruise was consistent with being hit by a baton, by a weapon, a cylindrical yeah. weapon. That's very interesting. I didn't get that one. Huh. We have uh, the body of Rustem Slobodin. Hypothermia death had a small crack in the left front portion of his skull, consistent with an injury caused by a blunt object. Rustem also had damage on his hands, consisting with punching someone or something. Okay. We have Nikolai Fibodeau Brignolis, died from a massive skull injury, an injury commonly found if the body had been thrown or jettisoned from a moving vehicle. Yeah. Force. I lots saw that. and lots of force. Yeah. He was found wearing two watches. One watch stopped at 814 and the other stopped at 839. Finally, we have Simeon Zol- Zolotaryov. He died from, his cause of death was from severe chest trauma, and he had five broken ribs. He had an open wound on his skull with exposed bones, and his eyes were missing. Now, I want you to keep in mind, when I say their eyes are missing, part of their lip is missing, their Mm -hmm. eyebrows are missing, their tongue is gone, Mm -hmm. the muscles of the lower part of their mouth inside are gone. There's no indication of animal attack. There's no other animal gouges on the body, teeth marks, bite marks, right. nothing. Yeah, when Keep like a, that in mind. When like a crow gouges out like a corpse's, you know, orifices, right, for scavenging. Yeah. Um, they do have these, these peck patterns things. Right. They're not medically precise. Right. With it to not They're not the, just gone. It's like one flick and the eyeball's off. It takes a few fucking flicks in there. Exactly. What the fuck? Not to mention it's harder <sighs> to pull these off cleanly after it's been frozen, after they're, they're frozen. Yeah, because how long would it take an exposed eyeball right. in the Siberian sub-below right. weather right. to freeze over? Right. An hour? Yeah. Great, if that. Right, it, yeah, maybe if, if, if that. that. Yeah, if that. So that were the conditions of the bodies. Now, where they were found, so Yuri Krivonoshenko and Yuri Doroshenko were found underneath a Siberian pine tree next to what appeared to be the burnt-out remains of a fire. Both were shoeless and dressed only in their underwear. Igor Dyatlov, Zenaida Kolomogorova, and Rustam Slobodin were found halfway between where Yuri Kurvanashenko and Yuri Doroshenko were found over there by the pine tree and the fire, the pines and the fire, and the campsite. Mm-hmm. So these three were found in between the fire guys and the campsite. From the position of the bodies, it appears the three tried to make it back to the campsite, but froze to death on the way. They were found separately at distances of 328 yards, 525 yards, and 689 yards away from the bodies of Krivonoshenko and Doroshenko. The remaining four members of the Dyatlov party were found on May 4th, 1959, 82 yards into the pine forest from where Krivonoshenko and Doroshenko were found by the fire and under four yards of snow. Now, those four that were found in May of 1959 were Ludmila Dubanina, Alexander Kolevitov, Nikolai Thibodeau Brinolis, and Semyon Zolteryov. That's the four. By the time we're done with the show, you're going to say his name's right. Oh, God, I know. So that's, that's all nine. All nine are accounted for. Now, what's even crazier is that those two who suffered chest trauma and the broken ribs, medical examiners said the force that would have been needed to cause those injuries would require the force found in a car crash. The problem is no external injuries were found on the bodies indicating that that kind of force was exerted onto the bodies. How do you explain that? Now, on the night of the Dyatlov event, a group of hikers stationed about 31 miles away from where the Dyatlov group was camped on Kolatsiako, the Death Mountain, Mm -hmm. 
Mountain of Death. They claim to have seen a strange, multiple strange orange spheres in the sky. Mm -hmm. The same type of spheres were also witnessed in the town of Ivdel mm -hmm. and all the surrounding areas where this took place. And apparently one of them was a military officer too. Yes, yeah. all through February and March, yeah. including the military as witness and the meteorology service. Yes, right. But you know what? They were told to keep that information out of the official Russian reports. Yeah, that goes along with another report of one of the people that were first there during the, uh, during the investigation party, I think, or search party. I, don't I think it was a search party. Search, yeah. Where they found a certain thing on the floor, which I, do, I know you're going to get to eventually. I don't know if I want to spoil yeah. it for you. No, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. I'll get there. Yeah. That was also like, I mean, that report was stifled. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's that's the story of the Dyatlov Pass incident. Right. That's and, what happened. Right. Uneventful till that one moment, and then all hell broke loose. Right. So what are some of the theories floating around out there as to There's what so many. happened? There's so many. I was learning about these winds that could oh, happen. Oh, I'm, I'm going to get there. Yes. Yeah, I got that. Tabashan wind, some of that. I forgot how to... Well, I went with the infrasound. Infrasound, nice. I yes. saw that one too. So we'll get there. Infrasound for sure. Now, some people say it was an avalanche. On the night in question, Catabotic. the party received some sort of clue, according to theory. The night in question, the party received some sort of clue that an avalanche was imminent. Maybe a, a rumbling sound or something. Yeah, can you feel it, like an earthquake kind of? Or? I would assume you could. No. And hear it. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, if you hear it, isn't it too late? I don't know. I don't know. Well, that's what they're saying. So they got some sort of so a sign, maybe a sound, maybe a feeling. The thought of getting buried under tons of snow is what actually scared them into fleeing the tent without their necessities. Right. Or maybe an avalanche did happen and the tent's entrance was blocked, so they had to cut the way out quickly and wait out further avalanche outside the tent and far away, planning to go back once it was done. Seems possible. The only problem is there were absolutely no signs of an avalanche in the area ever happened. Right, because they found the tents, too. Yes. Right. There was no avalanche debris found, nor avalanche tracks in the snow. Plus, this section of the Orals is absolutely not known to have avalanches. The fact that they found their footprints, too, is a sign uh, on some of these places where That's they were right, running. because they found footprints leading from the tent down and to the And their injuries are inconsistent. Yes. Oh, absolutely. On some of them, especially. Yeah. Plus, again, these are very experienced hikers. There's no way they would have put themselves in the path of a potential avalanche. Right. So I think this theory is bunk. Right. That sounds I think like so you too. do too. Yep. Okay. Now, this theory is kind of interesting. This is the infrasound theory. Hmm. Now, this theory proposes that wind whipping around Kolat Siakl created what's called a Carmen Vortex Street, mm -hmm. which can produce infrasound capable of causing extreme panic in humans, as well as, the, as well as the overwhelming feeling of dread and the urge to flee the, um, the immediate area. Like a fight or flight response being activated? Yeah, yeah. So there's a little to unpack here. I'm going to try my best. Yeah. Uh, a Carmen Vortex Street, okay, forms when wind moves around an object in a way that causes swirling vortices, Okay. These vortices can gain incredible speed and power and could, could produce something called infrasound. Now, infrasound, the second thing I want to unpack here, is sound that is below the range of what human ears can hear. Mm -hmm. In other words, any sound below 20 hertz. Infrasound can affect humans in all sorts of crazy ways. There's tons of scientific studies about infrasound. For example, a person experiencing infrasound could get headaches, dizziness, extreme annoyance, extreme fear, extreme anger, fatigue, could cause heart palpitations, could lead to night terrors, and overall a general feeling of pressure in the abdomen. Given this laundry list of freaky side effects, infrasound has been called the fear frequency. So in this theory, infrasound caused enough panic in the tent that the party was forced to flee by whatever means necessary. And once they were out of the infrasound's reach, in other words, down by the pine forest, 
and thus no longer experiencing the wild effects of infrasound, they decided to try and head back to the campsite, but got lost in the darkness and froze to death. Yes. Uh, that also goes uh, in, in relation. That's a very a good example would be like when earthquakes cause pigeons to crash land into exactly. things yes. that they would otherwise never crash into. Like it fucks up their telemetry or whatever. Yes. It just fucks up their insides. It makes them panic, makes them freak out, makes them fly erratically. Yes. Um, same thing goes with extreme heat. You could probably set up our extreme cold. Yeah. So it's just a, a human level kind of thing. Yep. And something else I read I thought was kind of cool. Um, mm-hmm. Tigers and lions, when they roar, mm-hmm. they're actually, um, part of their roar hits uh, 19 You're kidding. hertz, which causes panic and fear, paralyzing fear into their prey. You're kidding. Isn't that cool? That explains so much. Have you ever heard, like at the zoo, a lion yes. truly roar or a tiger I mean, really roar? I mean, I, yeah, but I don't know if it was like a big roar, you know. Part, but And I know, I've experienced this. Mm-hmm. You hear some of it, mm-hmm. but then you also feel some of it. Yeah. It's I the strangest thing. It's so weird. That's what they're saying might, might have happened. Still, right, we're still priming. Um, but the problem is, what caused the... The internal damage, 15 ribs total broken among two people. Right. The fractured skulls, the missing eyes, the fucking missing tongue. I'm glad you mentioned and focused in on the infrasound because that goes along with uh, what we'll eventually get to. I have a theory. Okay, okay. cool. Yeah, cool. So this is kind of a popular one, too. Another theory states that the Soviet government mm-hmm. is to blame because they conducted some secret military tests in the very same area where the Dyatlov party was camped. These tests would have been of something called parachute mines. Parachute mines are designed to explode in the air, close to, but not on the ground. Story goes that the party was awoken at night by the sounds of these parachute mines going off. And in kind of a shell-shocked state, they fled the tent, but they didn't know what the hell was going on. They ran to the tree line, couldn't, their fi- couldn't find their way back in the darkness and froze to death. And I like this. This is a good one because it explains uh, they're cinched, uh, the eyebrows. You think of... Uh, eyebrows think of missing. The, the one guy the had sc- charred skin. Right. The, 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 the tan, right? The, the dark... The dark, different dark colored skin. skin yep. Right. Yep. Uh, could explain if it actually hits one of them or well, debris, right? Well, here's the thing. For the party members that suffered those severe internal injuries mm-hmm. without showing external signs of those internal injuries... Yeah. That could have been caused by the downward pressure right. caused by the airborne parachute mines going off. Wow, that could be that big? Yes. Damn. And that was the source. Of they, the f- yeah, they equate the pressure of those cavities, like that, cav- that the chest one, to a car wreck. Right, right. exactly. Right. So that was the source of that force needed to cause mm-hmm. those internal injuries that examiners likened to that of a car crash. But not the incision. Without the exterior signs of bone damage underneath. Yeah, and the, the word was incision, you mm-hmm. know. Um, these parachute mines could also account for the glowing orange spheres yeah. people claim to have seen in February and March of that year Definitely. in that exact area. Mm-hmm. And this theory also goes on to say it was then animal scavenging that ate people's eyes and tongues, tongues and lips and the right. muscles of the mouth. And this theory gets even stranger. Now, it is a fact, one that I haven't mentioned yet, that radioactive material was found on some of the hikers' bodies. I thought it was just one. Was but it more not all one? of them. Mm-hmm. No, it was a few. Okay. This leads some to believe that it wasn't parachute mines being tested, but nuclear weapons being tested in this isolated area. Further, some reports say that at the time of burial, some of the hikers appeared orange in color, mm-hmm. and their hair went all gray. Is this further proof of clandestine nuclear weapons being tested, or just the normal decay process when a body is left out for months in Siberia's harsh weather? I like this one, too. Next up is the gravity fluctuation theory. Mm. Now, this theory is put forth by a Ph.D. physicist named German Orenko. Urchenko, German Urchenko. He believes that the party encountered a brief period of decreased force of gravity. The hikers in the tent would have suddenly been lifted off the tent floor and drug into the direction of the decreased gravity area. As the outside air pressure was significantly lower 
than that inside the tent, people began to push outwards. The emerging hikers instantly pushed the tent from the inside, hence the rip uh, in the tent from the inside. And since the pressure in their bodies still remained high, they received unexplained internal injuries, including broken bones. Yeah. Now, once outside the tent, according to this guy's theory, the hikers would have remained suspended in the air and the force was strong enough to throw them where the bodies were eventually found. Sounds like scientific or sci-fi craziness, but there really are areas of the earth where gravity is scientifically proven to fluctuate. And this area where the party was camped is actually one of them. Yeah. That is a good one because it's like an extreme version of something that you have to be, unfortunately, be there at the right time at the, you know, when it's happening. Exactly. The right conditions, the exact right. Right. And then um, probably nine times out of ten is really hard for us, you know, humans to be there at that time to have an incident like this. And I really like this theory for that reason. Yeah. Because like, this is one of them, 1959, where it happened. Yeah. These guys were at the wrong time, at the wrong place. Or, yeah, how do we want to look for at For them, this? right? Yeah, right. Uh, to give us this uh, this theory anyway, to at least give us this idea of this theory. Because uh, I, mean, I imagine not many people know about these gravity fluctuations that could occur yeah. on this planet. Yep. And it's... um. It's a very delicate magnetic system we have on here, the gravity and all that. It's very delicate. It can, and of course, it can fluctuate if the, if the conditions are exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So you, are you buying that one so This far? is like my favorite one. Oh, probably. favorite. Okay. Give okay. or take. Give or take. So I have one more theory. Yeah, no, I know this one. And I like yeah. this one. This no, one. I like this one too. This one's fun because there's a little proof to this one. Close second. Right? Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. So finally, I want to talk about the theory of the Menk. Mm-hmm. Or the Russian Yeti theory, the about uh, the abominable snowman theory. That's right. That's right. That's, words. that's why this is a hard one. Those who believe this theory claim that only a beast with supernatural strength could have caused the severe damage found on some of the bodies, the terrible internal damage, broken ribs, and the skull fractures. Yep. Now, they kept diaries, as I've mentioned a bunch of times. But they also created this cute little newspaper that they would uh, create every day, every couple days. And they'd be like, oh, dinner's at this time. And, oh, you know, it was like this kind of... Pass the time. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 they called it their newspaper. And you can right. see images of this yeah. online. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll post some links to the to this little newspaper they created. In this little newspaper, and well, there's a lot of talk about this. In this little newspaper... Um, as they were documenting their journey, one of the entries in this paper said, quote, we now know that the snowman is real, end quote. And this is fact. You could, you could look this up. You could see it. Um, and and I'll, I'll try to put a link to it. Some people try to say that, that this was just a joke. They were having a laugh amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. What was it? I will leave a link in the show notes of an actual picture taken during the expedition which shows a creature that does in fact look like a yeti or a bigfoot standing around some trees and this thing seems to be staring right at Nikolai Thibodeau Brignolis the cameraman who took that picture and to further the idea of a yeti killing the hikers two members of the original search party claim that footprints much larger than humans were found near the campsite yeah, the other stifled report I told you. Yeah, mm -hmm. but of course, this information was kept from the official Soviet report on the Dyatlov Pass incident. Yeah, lots of this information in his government at this time. Yeah, I mean, this even more was so than we can imagine now. Even decades later, this yeah. information came out. Yeah, you know. Um, so I think that's my favorite theory. Even the people who the saw the orange lights said that way aftermath, like way like years yes. later. It wasn't like right away. Nope. That yeah. was all supposedly suppressed. Yeah, I mean, they they tried they said it then, but they weren't. It wasn't like a release until years later. Yeah. So in a way, being so far removed from this incident, you know, how many years? Seventy years, sixty, seventy years. It's uh is um gives us a lot of a lot of like this all this time in between of what's been released, what's been declassified, yeah. what's okay to say now. It gives us a lot more room to talk about, which is nice. 
and I think we're going to be doing a lot more talking about it because the investigation has been reopened. Yes, that's right. Twenty nineteen in February. In February, I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. That was it's opened again. They're they're starting. To but look it's funny because they're looking at it not as a, but they're, they're taking out the suspicion of uh, any murderous intent, though. No murderous intent. Right. Um, I've read stories that there was a love triangle. Oh yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no. That's a there's a there's a tribe uh, that lives in this section of Siberia mm-hmm. called the Mensi. Mensi. Yeah. But they're an incredibly peaceful. Uh, tribe. Right. Yeah. There's no reason why this attack would have happened. And this way also, like, it's very strange. Yeah, plus there were no other footprints. Right, yeah. There were no blood spatters leading around. I mean, yeah. you'd think a massacre like this, there would have been evidence right. all over the site. And even then, like, you could think of a combination of things. Maybe the uh, the military experiments combined with the Yeti, with the footprints. Like, if I just attacked the, the two or three that were more huddled together, that had the most injury, right, injuries to their bodies, they were probably Yeti creature or Yeti attacks, you know? And then the rest were like, I mean, as part of the experiment, you know, drove them away from their thing. Oh, God forbid. Oh, so the like the gravity, weapon, if the weapon. Or the gravity fluctuation brought the creature over. Or you think a combination of this, right? Or you think of the Calabatan winds or even, even the infrasound. Yeah, um, the, the Calabatan winds, that's one I didn't put down, but it, it it had a lot of the same flavor to it. It's very in, cutting wind, it's just minus minus the psychological flight or flight response. It's basically the same thing. Yeah, not a vortex necessarily, but like slicing cutting winds. Yeah, that drive people. That, yeah, goofy. Yeah, goofy. Uh, it could drive people goofy, but it's mainly so violent that you have to get out of its path whenever possible. That's the idea with right. that. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's kind of rare. It's a rare occurrence, but it's very violent. And and very it's, akin it's, to like a hurricane. It's a real thing. Yeah, it's a real thing. Like it's a rare. hurricane in the middle of the Siberian. The thing is, that a lot of this, a lot about this place is very rare and weird because uh, you think of the gravity thing, you think of the the unexploredness of that area by man or civilized man. Let's say uh, that's another big component as to why this place is very rare to have been there at the time. Also, back then, you know. You think of these pictures this guy took, you know, it wasn't developed right away. He didn't know 100% what he was taking, maybe at that time. That was later shown to be like this, uh, what's it called again, the creature? The Menk. Menk. Or, or Yeti or Yeti, Abominable right. Snowman. Yeah. The Russians call it the Menk. Right. And it's, you know, super interesting confluence of sh- bad shit. They were yeah. in a bad shit area. Really, really bad shit area. <laughs> I yeah. mean... <laughs> um, that slope is the devil's. What's it called? The devil's. Well, what? The, the, uh, the mountain of death. The mountain of death. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and and there's there's other things. Um, one of the guys I can't remember which one. I didn't write it down, but he was supposedly found with a camera around his neck. Oh, you kidding? But the film was supposedly destroyed and mm. was unusable. I wonder. Um, one of the bodies was gripping a pencil in one hand and a little notepad in the other. Mm-hmm. And supposedly a, a Russian investigator grabbed it and said, nope, the, nothing, was, nothing was written on there. And that pad's been lost since. So who knows right. what was written on that pad. All yeah. sorts of really weird shit surrounds this case, man. Yeah. And those things could very well, stuff. like I would like to think that it's somewhere archived, but probably was just destroyed and that's it. We'll yeah, know. or it's in some... Some guy's basement somewhere. KGB. Desk. KGB. Yeah, exactly. KGB desk. <laughs> it's somewhere. in the bottom drawer of his KGB I desk. Mean, pro- I mean, I'm not saying that's how they all work, but in Russia, mountain Don't... kills you, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, Russia still is tons of secrecy, and it was yeah. even worse back then. Way Ten worse times back then. Worse. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were, the world was watching them the way we think we watch South Korea, or North Korea, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's a very interesting time for sure. Like I said, watch Chernobyl. Look at that disinformation, the oh, way they played yeah. the public and the world media, not just their own people. That's right. It's And that's all true stuff, too. right? So, so if we're going on this government cover-up cover thing, I could see it being a secret weapon yeah. that they don't want the U.S. to know about or the rest of the world to know about. I could totally see that. Yeah. That the is such a thing. 1959 Soviet Union thing to do. Very much. They were st- very much in the heavy thick of it still. Yep. They were not nearby. They were not nearly close to like not being Soviet Russia yet. Right, they yeah, two right, decades right. As, Oh no, they no. two whole decades yep. before they even thought of dismantling. Yep, that's how far away. So, that's what I have on the Dyatlov Pass incident. Very cool story, very freaky, still unsolved to this day. Yeah, and and there's tons of pictures online. That, yeah, there is that these uh, party members took yeah. throughout their expedition. I, I'll I'll put some links. 
And then there's also uh, photos of the bodies, how they were found. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I'll put links for those as well. So, yeah, I, 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 didn't, I guess I didn't go as far as you did on this one, um, but uh, I couldn't. I was looking for autopsy. I couldn't find any at the time. Could, oh, autopsy photos. Yeah, yeah. I think those are like, yes, does Soviet say classified or oh, top secret or whatever? Maybe. They don't. But you 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 see photos from the the rescuers. Yeah, you see the bodies and the in the snow and things, but. Um, yeah, but I will definitely put one of the supposed mink yeah. that, that my man Thibodeau Brignolas took. Not a bad picture. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good picture. I like that. It's not like just a foot, you know? Oh, no, it's a bot. It's a whole figure. Yeah, it's a whole figure. But, of course, what do people say? That was one of the party members dressed up, you know, had had two coats on, three pairs Actually, of pants. Actually, about that, uh, it's funny that you, I think it was a little bit of um, coincidence, like dark coincidence, maybe yeah, it's not irony. It would be a coincidence that they would, uh, in their fake newspaper, mention. Because, of course, if you're out there, how do you not joke once about a Yeti or a man? Oh, we now know the, the then, snowman then, is real. Right. Oh, they like, joke about it, how and then it happens to them, you know, on an off chance, right? And the, Well, yeah, they mention that, then they have the photo. Because I think they would have, if they actually genuinely thought that, they probably would have definitely written in the journals. You would you know, think, right? The reactions would have been... Not to stay on the slope, for example, or the reactions would have been way more, like, way more detail in their journals from the day before. You know? Yeah, because there was so much journaling. God, so much. They had to. Yeah, well, I mean, that's practice. <laughs> yeah, because they were also reporting for some Russian sport agency, like outdoor sport agency. Interesting. So they were also acting sort of like tourists as well. I wonder if they were like, anything, like uh, checking the place out everything. for like possible Olympian. Like uh, practice areas or like no, I just, to hold competitions. I just like think, that you know, it had to do with the certification thing. They're going for this mm, okay. top Soviet hiking certification. So they were. As they're trying to milk it as much as they could, I guess, as much things in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they were, they were going to report the stories back. And, and it, you know, all had to do with um, like some Russian hiking authority or some crap yeah. like that. Right, right, right. So they're also acting as tourists, too. So well, a, we know they were all paid the same back then. Yeah, right. Sorry. <laughs> Although I mean, eight of them were technically, I mean, students, right? They're all students technically, in a way. They're all in the in the technical institute. Nine of them were. Nine of them were. Yeah, yeah. Well, only. Yeah. Well, except for uh, yeah, yeah. He was a leader, right? He was. The yeah, leader. but I believe he was a student there. He was a well. student too. Yeah. The only guy. That he was young. He was all. Said, they're uh, all the same age, roughly. Yeah, the the one thirty eight year old guy, that ski instructor, he wasn't a student there. Right. Yeah. But uh, freaky, freaky stuff today. Volstok and Dyatlov. <laughs> you, you have to look at it. I did. Dyatlov. Because uh, you mentioned, you said Dyatlov or something before. I'm, I'm sure like, I've said these words 20 different ways. 20, yeah. I tried. No, yeah, we're all trying. Oh it's, just like, it's just like uh, the Junko one when you were mentioning some of the names. <laughs> I'm like, it's not Watanabe, it's Watanabe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was really funny in my head. Maybe I should just stick to U.S. stories. <laughs> no, no, no. Because I could say Jim I've, Smith. I've been saying that we should definitely. I love our exploration outside the, our little sphere here. Yeah, yeah, you're right. There's some great stuff out there, but if you're interested, um, there is one really. I mean, apparently, according to reports, I was, uh, I almost bought the audiobook. I might still. You get sent it. it to me. I almost, I almost did get it because I'm like, if I push it, maybe I can go through the whole thing. It's six hours long. Maybe I can go through the whole thing before we record it today. But like, no way. There was no fucking way I could do it. So, and that book is titled, let's see here, it's not titled, let's see here, it's called Dead Mountain, The Untold True Story of the Diablo Pass Incident. Nice. And it is a nonfiction book. There's a lot of fiction books, even people, by people who investigated or who were related, you know, like passerby, uh, you know, passingly to the yeah. investigation, like around that area, or journalists that covered the story would take the story and then make a, like a light plot out of it and then make a story, like a, a fiction story with a lot of the details, right? Okay. But a lot of details made up too. You now, know. what about the movies? We did mention at the top of this. I mean, the worst one, meaning like the most sensationalist, is a Hollywood movie called The Devil's Pass. The Devil's Pass. Yeah, with nine American hitchhikers, of course. <laughs> and the movie's obviously way different. And I haven't seen it, but from what I read about it. And I do want to see it just for kicks. Yeah, well, now that we've done... No, yeah, that we did all these videos. I want to, I want to pay it off by watching all the shit, you know? right? And there's a lot of documentaries of it too. Yeah, there's tons of documentaries. Way, way more Lots books. of stuff on YouTube. Yeah, so surprisingly, a good amount of stuff out there for you guys to 
consume. I would say consume it after you listen to this episode. I mean, you listen to it now. And then listening to this episode, checking out our links, because all that stuff is uh, the true pictures, the true articles, the true incidents reports. Checking that stuff out. And then check this other stuff out, because I think it'll make it more fun. Don't let it discolor you. Because some yeah. of the documentaries are very one-sided. True. Um, a lot of those movies and books are fiction. Now, the one I told you, the title, it's nonfiction. Check that out for sure. But the rest, a lot of them are, they take liberties. Yeah. And a lot of them also, like, they were detained. Like, they were told, like, you can't say this in your book. You know, it's not, cla- it's still, it's still not the classified. At least That's at, right. At the time when it was written. I did read something about, it was a, a doctor, uh, I think, who was going to release familiar. a book. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. He was told to kill it. Mm-hmm. But then all the details came out, you know, all these years after his death. Yeah. Like his daughter released it or something. Something like that. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Crazy stuff, man. Can you imagine? Yeah. So that's what we got. Yeah. And you, your favorite is the Meg. I do like the Meg. Yeah. But that infrasound. Is that what you actually think? Oh, you're that infrasound? That infrasound is it's, really interesting, too. It's super interesting. Because that, that we know is real. Yeah. Um, and it's just I, super I like rare. the term the fear frequency. You mm-hmm. know, and um, you know, I like I'll, that. One of the things that I actually thank God you remember because I forgot the inference are reminding me of how it can be combined or the true nature of the infrasound is the Yeti. The Yeti Makes causes the sound, the oh, sound yeah. to attack like bigger predators. So instead of the roar from the lion for its for the predator it sees in front of it or it's trying to catch or scare, it's for like a, a an area around. Right, I never thought of that. Creating that the, is a cool idea. The 19 hertz frequency for its prey down there on this ravine or area, or and this time it just happened to be human prey. All right, this time oh, happened to be human man. prey. That's that's a, that's a cool idea too. That is cool, right? Like for, it could be both, but not like a natural current or for sound. It's mank, mank sound. Love it. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess there's a little bit, you know. Of course, then there's the UFO angle. Where these people who are so yes. so severely damaged were picked right. up by the beam of the UFO and slammed onto the ground, mm-hmm. and that's how they got the internal injuries, uh, the broken ribs and the fractured skulls, the weird bruises. Um, some reports said that some of the trees in that forest were burned on the top oh, of you're the getting, trees, like cinched and stuff. Yeah, at wow. the top. Um, some articles said that, other articles didn't. I don't mm. know if it's true. Right. But again, that UFO, that sky source. Uh, but of course, if it was a weapons test, it could be damaged the by weapons too. Thing, right. The parachute mines, yeah. It could be parachute mines with a, you know, like a nuclear parachute mines. It could be something like that to spread radioactivity in an area. Right. And then there's, combine that. there's that whole angle. That right. That is true. There yeah. was radioactive material found on yeah. some of these bodies. Mm-hmm. Where the fuck did that come from? <laughs> fuck, I know. Uh, here's something a little, just interesting, I guess. Yeah. Um, I found a metal band, a Russian metal band called Sorni Nai. Sorni Nai. Um, they're one and only album that I could find, and it's on iTunes. I heard only one song, though. It's a, it's about that whole incident. It's about the deal of passes? The whole song, all eight songs. Wow. Yeah. So, it was just a one and done for them. Interesting. Yeah. I have right here. They have uh, titles like Kot, which is like death. Means oh. death. Oh, well, the death pass. Akba Kit Sony Nai. Oh wait, that's the name of the man. It's metal from. It came out in 2015. Could you play a sample? Uh right now here. Yeah. Okay. Could you press play? <laughs> I skipped ahead. Uh, he's saying something about them. I don't know what he's saying. All right, all right. That's a little sample. Yeah. Huh. So an entire sounds Russian... Sounds very dark. Yeah, it sounds like, like a doom metal or something. Came out in 2015 by... Produced by Blood Music. Blood Music. Blood oh, music. Blood Music. Of Why course. Those, that? those old souls and so... <laughs> those old dogs from the sea. Dogs from the sea. I never heard of that before. Uh, all right. Let's go. Uh, what did... Uh, okay. Honestly, Jay. Yeah. I know it's my first time. I'm sorry. How badly did I do? Oh, on your story? Yes. You didn't do bad. No? No. 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 It was awful? No, it bad. not at it all. Awful. No, it was good. It wasn't awful. It was horrendous. I think we should. you should do that more. I think you should do it more. Yeah, I I, I should have bolded things differently. I guess I found the name of that one guy I was forgetting on the notes. I just couldn't see it. Yeah. 
the worst. It's hard, isn't it? Hate myself. It's, it's not easy. Uh, well, no, comparing myself to you is what's not easy. <laughs> you know? Well, hey, at least you can say Russian names. Well, I can pretend to say Russian names easier. I don't know. Well, I guess, yeah, I guess I don't know if you're actually pronouncing it right. It sounds better than mine. Anyway. A Russian would know, but not me. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. Do we have any Russian friends? I don't. Uh, personally, I know a lot of Polish people, but no. Yeah, I don't think it's the same. No, pretty sure that they would say it's not. <laughs> pretty sure. Pretty sure. <laughs> Although a lot of the names are similar sounding. Yeah. But not really the same. Well, we did our best. Yes, I think we did really well. It's also a long show. How long is it? It took two hours. Shut up. Shut up. Okay, I'll shut up. No, don't shut up. Okay. Well, then we, you better take us home. Yes, yeah, so take us home now, you think? Um, yes. Scum diddly. I'm Cut just... to later. Oh man, oh, God. Oh, wow. <laughs> could, oh, you man. Edit, could you edit that out, bro? <laughs> so, me and my friend at work, he lives up in Jersey. We have this game where we call each other bro, but we have to think of creative ways to call each other bro. Okay. So, you know, today he was Rocky Balboa. I see. In, in the middle of my very important class this week in Jersey. Yeah. I introduced him as the Brolenium Falcon. Nice. In front of everybody. Yeah. And some people laughed and some people looked really like nervous. Like what what are we getting into here? For right. Me? Right. This is a cult that I've uh, yes. not drop. And then when he met me outside my hotel Tuesday morning, it was just turning eight o'clock. I was dead tired. I walked out because he was driving me back and forth from corporate office to my hotel. This week. Yeah. And when I walked out, I saw him like, oh, Zeus, what's up? He's, hey, Zeus. Mm-hmm. One of your people. No, he's Puerto Rican. Then I'm one of my people. But he, did. <laughs> but he didn't even say hello. He just threw his hands up in the air and he goes, hip hop hooray, bro. Hey. It was fucking hilarious. <laughs> and then today I text him when I land. He's like, let me know when you land. So I text him when I land and I go, thunder, thunder, thundercats. Bro, I mean, this is the kind of things we do. Inside jokes. Yes. Yes. A well, series of jokes where, like, you have to be there. You really do, because everyone else is looking at you like you're an idiot. Yes. Uh, what was? What are some other ones? Oh, he calls me Brohemian Rhapsody. That's a good one. That's a good yes. one. Yes. Um, God, there's so many. Brostrami Sandwich was one. Brostrami Sandwich. Because you know New York, they they're yeah, no, I, pastrami, so it's yeah, brostrami I, sandwich. Yeah, I got that one. That was funny. Um, GI bro, GI bro. <laughs> um, have you ever? <laughs> I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you something amazing. I'm gonna send you a link. Oh something. wait, I called them Oscar de la Broya. De la Broya. That's a good one. Okay. <laughs> You're like okay. <laughs> <It's> fun. <laughs> Uh, hold on. Two grown ass men. <clears throat> oh man, you're gonna love this. You're lucky you know me right now. What? Leave so much ammunition. <gasps> yes, because there'll be times, there'll literally be times when I'll, I'll go to call him. Yeah. And then I'll put the phone down because I don't have anything creative in my mind. Yeah. That's and then funny. I'll think of something, then I'll call him. Like you try to get a second date or something. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Jay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we gotta keep ourselves entertained. Uh, uh, here. Oh, thank God for people loving games. People make so many Wikipedia fandom articles and shit. It's great. Okay. Let's see. Come on. Give me the... Give me the... Oh. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Rambro. We Rambro! Rambro. Damn it. Bromando. Bromando. Mm-hmm. B.A. Brocus. <gasps> yes. There's a thing. This is a thing? This is a thing. Oh, my God. There's this game called Broforce. 
it's a great game. It's a fun platformer game, like old style game, like Contra style. Yeah. And you unlock action heroes from the nineties, seventies, eighties, no anywhere. And they all name them differently by bros. You get you unlock Rambro and you play as Rambro and you kill aliens and shit. It's great. I love it. It's fucking great. It's so creative. <laughs> Give me a bro help. hard. Bro <laughs> Mac Brover. <laughs> Braid. That's more like Blade. Uh Bro Dread. Bro Dread. <laughs> Snake Broskin. <gasps> yes. Brominator. <laughs> oh fuck, why didn't I think of that? Brobo Cop. He's called. He's called me Bro Cop. Okay, there you go. Indiana Brones. Oh, <gasps> yeah. yes. Uh, there's so many, man. Mister Anderbro. Who from, is it? That's Mister Smith uh, from The Matrix. Mister Anderson. Oh. Uh, the Boon Bros and the Boondocks. Kind of okay. Brochette. <laughs> Brochette. Oh, he's Puerto Rican. He'll love it. Yeah, bro. Oh, yeah. He Brochette. Works. Time Bro from Time Cop. <laughs> Time uh, Bro. Bro Universal Soldier. <laughs> <laughs> Bro Max as in Mad Max. <laughs> oh my God, so many ones. You got to send me this link. Double Bro 7. Double Bro 7. Yep. The Brocketeer. <laughs> Bro Heart. Bro Heart. Bro Heart. There you yeah. go. So many. So many on these. So I'm going to send you the That's link. That's fit. Oh, dude. I'm going to send you the link. I'm going to be off for over a month with these things. <laughs> <laughs> the Boondock Bros. Brochette. Bronan the Broberian. <laughs> that's a twofer. That one's yeah, great. Yeah. Bro Max the Bro. Double and double bro seven. That's a good one. <laughs> the Broketeer. Broketeer, yeah. <laughs> the professional. <laughs> that's right. I forgot about that one. Dirty bro. I unlocked almost all of this. I really played the shit out of that game that week. It was a good game. Oh, there's expander bros. Mm-hmm. Brock to death, broke to death. Trent Brosner. This is great. Cool. Love it. Yeah, keep your friendships paved nicely, you know? That's yeah, right. You really have the ammunition. That's right. It's good. You can't I also out. finished uh, Channel Zero. Have you seen that? Katie's so into it. I never really? got into it. Yeah. Has she seen the new season? I don't know. Season four? Because I just heard about it. I may buy the season because I really like the first three. Is that the one with the tooth fairy? The guy made a teeth? Yeah. But that's, but every that's when I stopped because I'm like, this is stupid. That's no, stupid. no, no. It's, it's, not, it's not about that, though. It's like a side character, but it's, uh, it has that in there. And I think it's really creepy, actually. Really? But uh, every season is different. It's an anthology show. Anthology horror. Mm, maybe I'll They're all different out. casts and everything. If you don't like that season, just skip it. If anything, the first season, which is the guy with the tooth, by the way, is called Pirate Cove. Yes. That's the first one. That's the yes. first season. And it does have its moments for sure. I would say it's probably the weakest one. The second one is by far the best. Really? Because it makes like um, this sci-fi concept to it where there's this the second one's great. It's called the No End House. No End House. And it's about this uh, this house that appears mysteriously in places around the world around Halloween time. And supposedly mm-hmm. it's like this coveted, you know, five-star Michelin kind of rating system version of a haunted house. Oh. And people go in, apparently it's free, and you get an invitation. Or you just, like, no, you just know when to go. And it's there in a house somewhere in some suburb, randomly, right? And the house is imp- kind of impenetrable. It looks different, looks weird. And you go in there, and you go through five, I think five stages. And... You, I'm not spoiling it to say that because in the first two episodes you go through all the stages, for example, okay. and then the movie is really about what's going on in there. Um, it's a, it's a it's a portal to another realm, mm. completely another realm. That's where the sci-fi kicks in. Okay. The other realm requires like living things, living humans in it to survive, and the way it manipulates humans who live inside it. The longer you're there, the more fucked up you get, and things get fucked up for a lot of people there. Wow. And you never know when you're out because that world looks similar to ours, but it's fabricated and they have to figure that shit out. Ooh. And it leeches off your memories and it creates like horror stuff based on your. It's so fucked up. It's so good. I like that movie. Uh, okay. Season. All right. And that's I the... trust your your uh, your judgments. So. I think you like it. I think you like it. Yeah. Cool. I mean, uh, the, the only thing that sucked about that season, maybe all of them, is that they're all involved like younger, like not preteen or anything, or not even teenagers. They're like twenty somethings. Yeah. So. Some dialogue can get annoying. But other than that, it's it's pretty good. The se- the third season is also very good. It's about this um 
this town that these two sisters go in, and they're all like, fucked up from drama and shit. And one of the, the both the sisters are worried about getting schizophrenia, which is inherited by their mother, I think. Okay. And along the way, this small town, which is like eaten up by this old company family who like owned the town right in the old days, the um, there's this giant like forest in the middle of it. And if you go in it at the right time, there's a staircase that magically appears that opens up these this family that's still alive, that's somehow still alive after all these years. There are like cannibalistically getting people and eating them, I think, but for the devil or some sort of demonic force. Holy shit. It's messed up. So yeah, I think you like it. You sold me. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. But that the first shit. one's probably the worst one. Yeah, I did. I as <laughs> soon as the, the tooth guy came out, I said, This is enough for me. This is dumb. Yeah. No, but man, those kids though in Pirate Cove and the later on. No, I like the Pirate Cove idea. Yeah, yeah. I just I don't remember where the Tooth Fairy guy came in. I think I don't I, remember. I, yeah, yeah. Early on, I think kids having memories of this wacky, weird show when they were kids. And yeah, and then no, then, then like, no one exists. That's cool. Yeah, that, that's, that's cool. I like that idea. It's a cool concept. The yes. movie, the show has good good concepts. Hmm. And I heard season four, so I haven't seen it yet. Cool. I wonder if she did. I know it was on our DVR for a while. I just don't know if she ever finished it or just deleted them or what. It's on Shutter. I gave you the account. That's oh, I that's right. That's, that's right. I saw it. Channel Zero. Yeah. Cool. Check it out there. Did you ever see Peaky Blinders? Not yet. I know there's a new season. I thought it. Yeah, I, I thought just it, finished it. I thought it ended. No. Oh. Oh no. It's it's going to continue even more. Oh wow! I didn't know that. I thought it ended for sure already. So this is the fifth season. Mm-hmm. So there's definitely going to be a sixth. Yeah. For me, that's like Pirate Cove. I tried it in the first season. I made like three episodes. I'm like, ah, I don't know. Oh, dude. I know. It's I, so great. A lot of people I know are watching the shit out of it, but I don't know. Yeah. I'll get to it eventually. It's and, five seasons. It's a lot and of Tom Hardy's in it too. And I love Tom Hardy. I heard. Yeah. And also Killian Murphy is the main star, right? Yes. Yeah. And he's, he's great. He's, he's great. Actor. Yeah. I like him. Um, I always so. wonder what happened to him. I guess he's been doing this show. So. Yeah. You know, because he was gone for a while from movies. Yeah. Like, I think the last thing I remember, he was. Uh, Inception. In Batman. He was in Inception. In Batman right. too. Batman 2. What did he play in Batman? It was... Uh, oh, he played in the first one. He played the... Um, the psychiatrist. Yeah, the uh, psychiatrist. Exactly. He uh, turns into... What's his name? I want to say, like, Jack Lantern. What the fuck was his name? That's close, though. I feel like that's close. Fuck. Because he had the mask. Hmm. I forgot what his character was. That's right. Happy deal. Everyone knows. Everyone knows. Yeah, yeah. About. Scarecrow. That's it. I love it. As soon as I dismiss the idea, like, <laughs> if I remember, it comes back. Kind of like Scarecrow. when we were trying to think of that artist, yes. Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, that was funny. I just said recently again, I'm like, doing the 100 so like, like, man, we take forever <laughs> no. to remember that shit. That show came out pretty good. I think so. The the question question people answer. liked it? Oh, I don't know. Figured I haven't gotten anything. Hmm. I haven't gotten anything good or bad. That's right. So, someone did, they left a, a real nice comment on Facebook. It was like, you know, congrats, congratulations on your 100th episode. You guys deserve it. You're one of the best paranormal podcasts out there. Here's to 100 more. Oh, that was pretty nice. Oh, you like it this week? I took two people's phones and I added our podcast. To yes. Phone. Yes. They don't do it willingly. <laughs> Gorilla that shit. <laughs> yeah. No, I told them what I was doing. But yeah, one was a customer. I do that to one of my students this week. Nice. Not, not put it on her phone, but told her all about it and... Yeah. That's the one whose husband is doing the movie. This is uh, this girl from Florida that works in my store. She was from Florida until recently. It's her first winter. Oh, shit. <laughs> She's complaining so much about the cold today. I'm like, it might snow today. And she's like, no, it won't. Shut up. It's too early. Like, it could snow. And I told the customers around us, if it's snow tonight, would you guys be surprised? They're like, no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Five. Four, I'm actually kind of nervous. Why am I J now? Three, <laughs> two, 